And it looks like we have a quorum, so I'm going to get started. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Lori Charlton. It's February 21st, 2023. I want to welcome you all to this quarterly review meeting of the Board of Finance. I'll call the meeting to order and ask that uh, we all rise and unmute ourselves. Mr. DeWitt, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the United States, United States of America, to the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, invisible, with in liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. To the members of the public who've dialed in or joined us on the WebEx tonight, please know that you're muted and will not be heard by board members, and there will be no live public comment this evening. Uh, members are, of the public are always encouraged to send their comments and questions in writing to the board at bof at fairfieldct.org. If you do, uh, please remember to include your name and address for the record, uh, as you would with uh, live public comment. All right, I'm going to jump right into item three to review the status and timing of various open items. Um, a number of you have uh, reached out regarding open requests from our last several meetings. Uh, Mr. DeWitt, I know you made a point of reiterating some of those open items during our last meeting. Uh, we do have uh, a number of things. I'll walk through them. We're not going to be able to cover most of them tonight, but I, I will make sure we're responsive to all open questions from board members that we have answers from the administration and that we have adequate meeting time to review all that information. Uh, after tonight, we have just one more scheduled meeting before the budget hearings begin on March 8th. So my hope is that we can uh, get to each of these open items uh, before the budget process starts. Uh, first item, the WPCA trunk line project. Uh, for everyone's information, the WPCA has updated the financial plan that was initially put before us during the capital planning workshop on January 31st, uh, and it's ready for review with the town. My understanding is that the updated plan will address the projected deficit in the WPCA fund that we saw in the first version so that we can collectively understand how the current capital plan will impact the, uh, the town's debt service versus the WPCAs. We also asked for a debt capacity analysis so the board could understand the, uh, the amount of headroom that's available to cover unanticipated cost escalations, other contingencies, or other projects. I, uh, capacity analysis was presented at one point to the capital working group, but it's not been reviewed with this board, and some of the assumptions have changed since the working group saw it, so we are expecting that as well. Uh, and again, I hope to have all of that uh, before us next week. Uh, second item, uh, just capital projects more broadly. We will get our regular update tonight on the status of ARPA and bonded projects that have been approved in the last two years. Uh, but there are a number of older authorizations, some of which relate to active projects and, and some which do not. Um, this has come up a number of times uh, since last fall, and we will have an open item or we will have an item before us next week to uh, deauthorize spending for some older completed projects. And uh, thereafter, our capital projects updates should be comprehensive and include all, all open active capital projects, regardless of when they were authorized. Uh, I, I also asked the administration to uh, reconcile the differences between the information that's been getting presented to us at our meetings versus the information that was included in the audited financial statements. Uh, third item. We have uh, a number of follow-up items from the internal audit presentation given during the January 10th meeting. Uh, there were questions on bidding practices, and we asked the administration to provide detail on bid waivers that were issued in calendar 22. Uh, I did get some preliminary data on that topic. Uh, it's extensive and not easy to understand, but it will be reviewed by the Purchasing Policy Committee during the March 2nd meeting, and we'll provide an update to the board next week. There were also follow-up items related to management's responses to audit findings on internal controls at the transfer station uh, and questions about revenue for WPCA septic fees. 
In addition, we asked for a status update on internal audit on the internal audit recommendation related to the registrar of voters issue. Uh, there is an audit committee meeting on March 2nd, and we should have an update for this board after that. Um, fourth item, we asked for an analysis of remediation costs related to the fill pile issues and other historical contamination. Uh, it's been quite some time since uh, we got a detailed update on that matter. Uh, the board may recall when the town's audited financial statements were presented earlier this month, uh, we saw a number, I believe it was 1.4 million for fiscal 22. Uh, and we asked for an, an analysis of what that money was spent on, what sites, with whom, and under what authorization. Uh, we also learned that the uh, estimate for the total remediation liability was reduced pretty substantially in the last year. Uh, and given that this board has voted on multiple occasions to put money aside to cover that liability, we asked for uh, an update to understand uh, the current estimate. Okay, last open item. Um, I want to make the board aware that a resident contacted Mr. DeWitt and I in our capacity as members of this board's purchasing policy committee. Uh, through a FOIA request, the resident received information from the town about policies related to the town's American Express credit card program and the usage of town credit cards by town employees. Uh, based on the information that was FOIA'd, the resident alleged that credit cards appear to have been used by town employees in a way that was in conflict with town policies. Uh, Mr. DeWitt, Mr. Matola, and I participated in conversations with the town attorney and HR director on this issue. And we understand the town is performing an investigation of the issues that were raised. Uh, this has been ongoing for a couple months and uh, my expectation is the investigation should be completed soon and that the board uh, will get an update once uh, the issues are resolved. Okay, any questions on any of those items before we move to item four? Mr. Curley? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the update. Um, looks like we've got a lot of open items that hopefully we can close off before we get into the budget. Um, I, on that last item, that one was kind of a surprise, but the, um, I, I appreciate the, your comment that uh, this is an ongoing investigation. So forgive me if I, and stop me if I ask something that's um, inappropriate given that, but um, given that it was a FOIA request, um, is it appropriate to disclose who the resident was or is that not acceptable at this point? Is that public? Is that public information? Um, yeah, the resident was uh, Dana Carey, who is um, a former RTM member and uh, a member of the town's ethics commission, but she did not right on behalf of the ethics commission or in any way um, in her role as a commissioner. This was uh, just a, uh, a request that she made independently as a resident. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Thank sure. you. Uh, and again, um, I don't wanna ask questions that are uh, probing into the investigation. I wanna respect that process, but um, is it acceptable to ask what policies are in question? Like, Madam, Madam Chair, I think we need to be careful. I think we should go to executive session and to uh, echo. No, we're Curley's, not. Um, and excuse and to, me, let me, Mr. Let, Testani, please, let, please. Let, let, let me let me finish making my point. And Mr. To Testani, Mr. please wait to be to recognized echo, before you speak. Please. To echo Mr. Curley's statement, I'm not sure why the rest of the board wasn't informed. Thank you. I'll I'll address that. So first of all, Mr. Curley, I appreciate you understanding that we're, we're not discussing any aspect of an investigation. Um, Mr. Testani, to your point. Um, when we start um, naming think, residents and their names, I think we need to go into executive session. That's just my the resident, opinion. The no, resident you. wrote a letter to the board. That is not a, that, that's not a confidential I, issue. I, didn't, I did not see a letter. I did not see a letter from that resident. When that's you say wrote a letter me. to the board, that includes everyone. Okay, so let me just go through this again. 
the resident wrote a letter to Mr. DeWitt and I, or contacted Mr. DeWitt and I in our capacity as purchasing policy members on this board. So I was asked who that resident was, and I gave the name of that person. We, to Mr. Um, Curley's point, you know, we're not gonna, you know, I don't have, I don't have any information um, about the town's process here. And even if I did, it wouldn't be appropriate to discuss it. So what I will say though, um, is that, um, you know, for, for our board, um, the issue as I see it is to understand um, as part of this process, whether there are policies or internal controls that need to be reassessed and whether there are adequate resources in place to carry out those policies and controls effectively. Um, that is our board's role. We're about to go into budget season. We may have questions on these issues. Our role is not to get involved with or comment on any aspect of this that may be an HR matter. I frankly don't know what the outcome of this is going to be or whether there will be any issues uh, that are either, you know, significant, immaterial, whatever. But um, getting back to Mr. Testani's question, which I think is a good one, um, I'm disclosing it because I feel I have a responsibility to tell the board. Uh, initially, when the investigation started, um, you know, it, uh, we wanted to give the town some time to deal with it, but it's been several months now. And as I said, I, I feel I have a responsibility to tell the board at this point because, you know, when these things drag on, if there are policies, et cetera, in question, uh, the longer these things go on, you know, that, that could put the town at risk as well. So, Madam, Madam Chair, if you're going to continue to use the word investigation and continue to um, imply that other Board of Finance members were not informed, which is clearly the case here, I, I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session right now so we can discuss this in the proper format to use Mr. Curley's verbiage, because clearly, Using words like that could be detrimental to this person, to the town, to the investigative process, if there is one. And I, I, I think it's totally inappropriate to have this discussion in an open format. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Testani. I am not, we're not discussing anything confidential. That's, I made a motion, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, does anybody second that motion? Or Mr. Okay. Walsh, do you have a question? I'm seconding the motion. Um, you, you can't just come on here and say you spoke to a specific resident about stuff that comes before our board of finance and not tell us about it. Would you like we me to not tell you, Mr. Walsh? We, we, what should, are you we, we should have been told about this. We should have gotten a copy of the letter because it was a communication to the board. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should go into executive session. I would like to know everything that was told to you and Chris. That information is not to be held between you and Chris. You have no investigative role in this. So I would like to know everything that was told to you, both of you, but I'd like to do it in an executive session since there seems to be some type of investigation. Okay, so first I just wanna be clear that I understand your concern. This is the reason I'm telling you, all right? The reason, the reason that I'm disclosing this is I feel I have a responsibility to tell the board and not to keep this um, to myself, uh, we're not going to discuss anything about the there's investigation second, because I don't know anything about it, and I'm there's sure. nothing to discuss. Point of Mr. order, Tassani, I'm going to please I'm ask calling, you. To I'm calling a point. I'm calling a point of order. I don't need to be recognized to call a point of order. Okay, there, call your point of order. There is All a right. motion on the floor. Else? There's a motion on the floor, and there's a second. Thank you. Right. Um, anybody? All right, let's take a vote. Does anybody want to go into executive session? Mr. Testani, Mr. Ms. LeClaire, Mr. Stark, Mr. Um, Walsh. One, two, three, four. Anyone else? Mr. DeWitt? Five. Anyone else? Okay, opposed? Ms. Marmion, Mr. Curley, Ms. Charlton, Mr. Matola. Okay, so I am, uh, so 
we have a vote to go into executive session. Other than, you know, basically what I've told the board here. So, um, you know, I, I understand the frustration that I didn't speak about this earlier. I've been uncomfortable. That's why I'm telling the board. I'm, I'm trying to respect the board and pass on the information that I know. And nobody should blow this out of proportion. The the letter two months ago. That would have been respecting the board. Well, when, as I said, Mr. Testani, I spoke to the town attorney and uh, and others and followed their advice. So did you, did you discuss it with the first select woman that you'd bring this up tonight at tonight's meeting in a public format? No, I did not. Okay. There you go. It's called there being blindsided. So I, I'm, I'll, I'll hold off on the motion until we get to the end of the meeting. That's okay, fine. I, I'm, not, I'm confused as to, you know, you seem upset that I didn't tell you, and now you seem upset that I raised it. So I'm not oh, really sure where you're going well, with that. I'm upset that, number one, I'm upset that the, not just me, the rest of the board wasn't informed. Let's start with that. And then number two, that it's clear that this should not be open to any discussion in a public format at all. So we voted and it passed to go into an executive session. I'm willing to wait until the end of the call or okay. the end of the, our meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions on this matter or on open items? Well, while we're at it, maybe we should, maybe we should figure out exactly what, what is the uh, rationale uh, for having to go into an executive session to discuss this. I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I will just, and the reason I voted no, I'll just state, is mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the fact that someone on the board got a letter from a resident is not a confidential matter. If we were going to discuss, um, if we were going to discuss something about the investigation, which I can't because I don't have any information, that would be a reason, but it wouldn't be my meeting. We would have the appropriate people from the town here. So, and Mr. The first would, would have and should have been informed. But while I'm saying that, Madam Chair, this motion has already been presented, already been voted on, already passed. I understand Mr. Stark has a question about it. However, that question should be dealt with during the executive session because we're back to talking about the subject all over again, and it shouldn't be. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, DeWitt? Leave it there. Mr. DeWitt? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, Mr. Testani is correct me. There is a motion. We're going to go into executive session. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to say for 2 seconds why I voted. Why I voted to go into executive session and that's to make sure that everyone on the board is very clear about what the process has been and why why things have and have not been disclosed. So uh, we're going to talk about an executive session. So, you know. <clears throat> I make a motion to move that to the end. Of, well, I don't have to make a motion. It's already at the end of the meeting, so I say we move to the next data item. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Walsh. Chairwoman Charlton and and Mr. Dewitt, have you both seen these FOI uh, documents from Dana Carey? Have you reviewed them? I have not seen all of the documentation. No, any of them. I haven't seen any of the documentation, though. No. Charlton? Uh, yes, I saw um, the copy of the policy that was provided and some summaries of credit card statements, which didn't have any um, detailed information in them. I, I, I apologize, Mr. Walsh. I, I, I did see the, I, I did have that information forwarded to me. I have not reviewed it, but I have seen the the, the MOU. Uh, my apologies. That's true. Okay, we can talk about an executive session, the contents of it. Thank you. Other questions about open items? No? Okay. All right. So we are going to move on to, uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, item four, to review the current status of the town's pension and OPEB funds. Can I have a motion to hear this item? Um, Ms. Marmion, seconded by Mr. Matola. All right, the backup materials for this item are posted online. 
beginning on page one. Um, I believe, do we have Ms. Trabuco here? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Uh, welcome, Ms. Trabuco. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for taking us through the materials. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Um, allow me, please. I'd like to present to you the, um, the performance period for the pensions and OPEBs, the period ending, the three-month period ending uh, December 31st, 2022. Uh, the pensions information is on page one. Um, you'll see that's the Vanguard handout, handout that we receive now quarterly. Market value of the pensions, $413.7 million, three-month performance. So again, this was the December 31 quarter end, up 5.35%. Fiscal year to date, uh, we'll call it flat, up 0.03%. Um, the allocation remains consistent with where we have been um, over the past, say, year. 53% uh, in equities, a 60-40 split in the equity between do uh, domestic and international. 31% allocated to fixed income, split 70-30, domestic, international. 7.7% um, allocated to private equity in that quarter, 6.8% to real estate, uh, under 1% allocated to cash. If we were to look closely within the performance period, you'd see that equities were strong, domestic stock, uh, domestic equities up 7%, international up nearly 15% in the quarter. Fixed income relatively flat, Private equity is priced on a three-month lag from a reporting standpoint, down 3.5% in the quarter, and real estate uh, a priced uh, on a three-month lag up modestly 1.5%. If we were to characterize kind of the investing environment, um, bear in mind we had seen over the course of last year a historic and rapid rise in interest rates. Uh, inflation has become less of an issue, but um, many commodities have remained elevated in price. Overall, um, we seem to have come through the worst of, of what we experienced last year with the, with the Fed moving to the higher, higher interest rates. Um, I'll move on to OPEB, um, which is uh, further back into your packet, maybe seven, eight pages back. It's the OPEB performance uh, packet page one. Um, as of December 31, 2022, market value of OPEB funds, 69.9 million. The three-month performance um, ending 12-31-22 was up 7.19%. Fiscal year to date, up 1.79%. Allocation is a little more um, facing equities, as, as has been the case um, for several years. 69.7% uh, in equities, split 60-40, domestic international, 19.8% allocated to fixed income, split 70-30, domestic international, 10% allocated to real estate. And then uh, we've begun to allocate toward private equity. Um, that allocation currently stands below 1%. Um, there's a long-term target of 10% private equity. Similar performance characteristics, um, you know, equities were strong, fixed income pretty flat for the quarter, real estate up modestly up 1.4%. Um, we've had many discussions about the allocations, um, why we remain watchful on private equity and real estate. Um, the board has consistently decided with the, um, with the, with the guidance of, of Vanguard as our, co as our OCIO and co-fiduciary to keep the allocations consistent uh, as they have been not to change them. Um, bear in mind, we're not trying to trade the markets or time the markets. We're taking a very long-term perspective here. Um, if I could kind of catch you up more generally on the goings-on at the JRIB, um, we moved to slim down our number of meetings. We're now meeting six times per year uh, rather than um, 11. Um, we are receiving quarterly performance reports from Vanguard, uh, not monthly. We kept them monthly for almost two years as we transitioned. Uh, we were really an outlier among the OCIO clients who largely receive quarterly performance uh, reports. So we'll receive quarterly performance reports, but they monitor the portfolios daily um, and we maintain a constant dialogue. Uh, so highly confident that should, should the need arise, we can certainly call a meeting and address what needs to happen. Um, preliminarily speaking, Vanguard's been doing some modeling for us on the portfolios, particularly now there seems to be some yields back in the market, which would be very favorable to our fixed income exposure. Um, based on their initial modeling, um, 
they would recommend that we maintain our discount rate at 6.9%, not raise it, not lower it, but keep it there. Um, we have a higher degree of certainty off of their modeling that we will certainly make that make those numbers and that's the right place for us to be. Bear in mind that this is a decision we make in consultation with the actuary Milliman and that meeting will happen as it usually does in July. Uh, in fact, it will be on July 26th that we'll have that analysis and that discussion. Um, as I said before, the, the you know higher rates typically are, are a positive for the math uh, and the way that we think about pensions and pension performance. And, and so while it's difficult from a cost of capital perspective across the economy, it's actually a, a beneficial um, thing for your pensions uh, and, the, and the pension investments. Um, we think there's good underlying support to kind of keep, keep steady as you go on the allocations. We're very satisfied with what we're seeing. Um, lastly, um, the pension administration, if you recall, we're moving that um, to Milliman as well. They'll be handling and professionalizing the service. These are things like allowing our pension um, members to look up their balances, to be able to change their addresses, interact um, with a system. Um, that process has been going on for several months. They anticipate, Milliman anticipates completing it uh, within the next few months, not, you know, maybe by June. Um, importantly, we've asked the question of them consistently um, whether or not anything unusual has come up as they've taken all of this information into their systems. And they have consistently responded, I'm very happy to say that nothing unusual has, has shaken loose or come to their attention during this process. Um, with that, that's what I have. Happy to take any questions um, or happy to call it there. Thank you, Ms. Trabuco. Uh, questions from the board? Okay, uh, Mr. Walsh. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can yeah. hear you now. All right, would you prefer me call you Carolyn or Ms. Trabuco? Oh, I like Carolyn. Okay, Carolyn. Uh, thank you for that. We've known each other for a number of years, a so I appreciate that. Um, when you have your quarterly meetings now, do you look at like, or, or do you have to wait for the actuary to actually do the calculation for what the amount funded is, like the percentage of funded for the pension? I, I know not. I know the OPEM number is low, much lower. But do you look at that that quarterly? No, the funded status. You mean? Yeah, the funded status. I'm funded sorry. Funded status happens um, as part of the actuarial reports to you and to the town. Yes. Um, so that only. No, and I, I, we don't see that on a rolling basis yeah. um, or on a spot basis, unfortunately. So that's really only once a year, basically. Yep, yep. It's kind of a one day a year. It's similar to a, a balance sheet, right? That it's a reflection of a particular day. All right. And when your board looks at the return levels, um, I know you look at it on a quarterly basis, but do you, in looking at like, do you look at it at the year, the calendar year at the end? Is that like, because because obviously the calendar year wasn't too great, right? No, no. I mean, if we look at kind of the calendar year, you know, the one year return for the pensions um, was down 13%, right? Yeah, not, fiscal, not year as date, well. yeah. fiscal year to date, flat 0 0.3. That, that we see, we see going back to uh, 10 years. So we look at a one month, three month fiscal year to date, one year, three year, five year, 10 year view. When the actuary looks at it, what date are they looking at as of the end of a calendar year, or do they look at it at the, the end of a year. fiscal year? Fiscal. So, it's so a that'll fiscal. be June. That'll be June thirtieth. So I guess we have some time to recover by then, but we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. So we'll just keep monitoring that. All right, that's the only questions I have for you this evening. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Other questions from the board? Okay. Um, I have. Just a couple quick ones. I'll call you Carolyn too. <laughs> um, so the 6.9% discount rate, I, I think just to make sure I understood that. So you said based on preliminary conversations, you don't think that's going to change. Is, is that the, that hasn't changed from last year either, right? We've held that last year and the year before. We've held that. Okay. Same. And the, you know, rise in long-term interest rates is not impacting that. Well, it would impact it on the positive side, right? From a performance standpoint, it would become easier for us to to meet 
No, uh, I understand. Uh, that's why I'm, that, and that's kind of why I'm asking is kind of, you know, I don't know. I realize we, we look at these things on a long, on, you know, we look at longer term measures, but kind of given the, um, the trajectory of rates versus where they've been for a number of years. Um, you know, I thought maybe we, there might, you know, might be some reason for that to creep up a little bit, but you're saying not yet. So, you know, we can get into a long conversation of, about, you know, the terminal rate uh, with the feds, you know, kind of the feds targeting right now and what the terminal rate would be and whether rates would roll back and what the long-term rate should be. Um, I think, I think, I think to be determined, Right. Um, allow us an opportunity to sit with Milliman, have them do the numbers um, for us. And we're not, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe anyone on the JRIB wants to um, wants to deliver a discount rate that is over or under the correct threshold. Right. right. We're not. We're not looking to. I'm not looking to be um, overly conservative or overly aggressive. Just trying to get the, the numbers right for you. Um, and, and so I think we'll, we'll come back around. You know, December was a good repair month. I think January was really strong in the markets. Um, with luck, the fixed income portfolio will, uh, will, will perform as, as it has historically. Right? Okay. And yeah. And part of day. yeah, we could see it. Yeah. We could absolutely, it's not out of the realm of possibility um, that we would look to raise the discount rate. Right. It all depends on the outlook for fixed income, um, which is still, I think, a work in progress. And part of the reason I'm asking, I realize we don't have a significant, you know, um, allocation in private equity, but is it, um, you know, are we seeing those valuations um, decline as a result of, um, you know, increasing rates and, and sort of, you know, just discounting you know, cash flows of, of private entities out in the future at higher rates or a higher rate needed to kind of invest, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, we're going to need some help around how we model that. Um, and part of the conversation within our specific portfolios is the existing private equity funds um, are pretty late in their life cycle, right? We've been gotcha. receiving distributions um, uh, for, for a couple of years. And it was only last year that we decided to to, to make fresh investments into the private equity because, because the allocations were going to fall, right? Because we were receiving distributions. Um, and so to maintain the allocations, we, we, we made the decision to invest with HarborVest, the private equity fund. We've had very few capital calls. We're at the very beginning of that cycle. Mm -hmm. And so there is, you know, I don't want, I, I don't want to be too wonky or policy ish here or just kind of get too in the weeds rather of the numbers, but we, we might be in a sweet spot regarding the private equity performance because we've received the capital distributions, you know, the nice returns from the existing positions. Um, and, and we haven't yet to reach kind of the, the ramp up on the new allocations. But, but I, we, we need Milliman to help us model that out to be able to figure the offsets. Okay, thank you. And then just one other quick question. On the Milliman process, you mentioned that they're going to take, um, and I, I don't know, how I would quite describe it. I'm not sure outsourcing is the right word, but they're going to take some, they're going to, it sounds like they're going to take some function from yeah. us where they're where participants will now be able to uh, check for certain information online. I presume that was done manually before yeah. um, through town employees. Um, how much does, is that going to have an impact on, um, and the need for resources in the town. I mean, was yeah. that like the whole person's job or do you have any idea? So, so yeah, so the idea has never been to replace the benefits department for the town, right? right? The, benefits, the benefits department still has a very important role to play here regarding uh, the pensions. So if you were to a town employee, you were to announce your retirement, you're still going to interface and you're still gonna go to the benefits department and fill out that paperwork. This is more of the ongoing you know, main maintenance of of those accounts. Um, this is this is an opportunity to bring it online to professionalize some of the some of the functions that were done um, by the town very manually intensive. Um, never it, this was never thought as something to replace the benefits department. Um, okay, or, so or it, this is this is sort of in, I don't know if it's additive or enhanced service, and and this is cost that's going to be absorbed by the pension fund, correct? 
The pension funds are paying for this. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, other questions from board members? Doesn't look like there are any. All right. Well, Carolyn, thank you for coming. Sorry you didn't bring your class with uh, with you this time. <laughs> it's all right, guys. So this sounds like tonight's going to be a lesson in uh, in 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 public meetings. Um, enjoy <laughs> next this fall. I'll bring my class back to you. <laughs> Take all care. All right. Thank, Good night. thank you again. All right. We are going to move on to item five to hear the um, BOE fiscal twenty three Q two financial update. Can I have a motion to hear this item? Uh, Mr. Curley, seconded by Mr. DeWitt. Okay, so the materials for this item begin on page 30 of the posted backup. Um, I saw, oh, Ms. Laborious, uh, are you going to be taking us through this? Yes, thank you, Ms. Charlton, right. and um, thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Board of Education. Um, so um, attached in your packet, you'll find the Q2 results for FY22 to 23 that takes us through the end of December. Um, the documents include a summary by major classification of projected and encumbered balances, a detailed summary by major classifications and additional detailed financial information. Overall, um, we proposed to the board to initiate transfers as a result of surpluses that I'm gonna walk you through in personnel and transportation um, for critical needs in maintenance, um, for needs in our IT five-year um, cycle, which um, refresh cycle for uh, equipment, which helped to reduce our uh, budget ask that we look forward to starting off of the conversations with the Board of Selectmen on Friday. Um, and then um, also for training and material purchases necessary for our literacy program. Ultimately, the board voted on, um, I'll, I'll walk you through which items they voted on um, transferring, but pending on that big item for the literacy, um, which is as it's part of a mandated legislative requirement to align curriculum needs in literacy at the um, pre-K through three levels. And as part of an overall comprehensive plan, that's also part of the budget development. Um, we're hoping to initiate some of that this year. Um, so our fiscal 22-23 began with a fully budgeted headcount and projected need for busing all students based on our historical trends. Um, we continue to experience personnel vacancies, particularly within the paraeducator title, and it resulted in personnel and associated fringe benefit savings. And we also had a shortage of bus drivers. I think we've spoken about that at a few Board of Finance meetings. Um, and also in Finance Committee, we did follow up with some detailed information um, that's available to, to the public as well. We would opt op optimally operate at 119 buses. We were at the time of this projection operating at 102. I'm happy to say that we've since added about three buses um, to our overall busing um, needs. And the reason you don't hear a lot from your neighbors about delays is because um, the really great efforts of our bus drivers and our whole bus community, our transportation community, um, we're able to leverage longer hours essentially of our bus drivers and bus runs to make ends meet and make it work during this time of a shortage. Um, and as we walk you through the budget, um, as we get to the Board of Finance next week and to the Board of Selectmen, you'll note that we did take into account this adjusted availability of drivers in our budget request. Um, as that said, we're focused today on the Q2 results. So um, following the trend in the summary document, you'll see that we had planned to fill vacancies at rates we had in the past, um, but the attrition was greater than expected, particularly in retirees on the certified level. Um, I have a lot of detailed information that the Board of Ed did ask us to walk through on our attrition assumptions um, in our budget documents and budget documents backup that I'm happy to share. Well, I've shared with the Board of Finance, um, but I'm happy to point out where to locate that information because it does include our current year um, projections as well as next year assumptions in great detail on that particular issue as we discussed at the Board of Ed table. Um, the So um, fixed charges, health insurance follows the trend that we're seeing in personnel. We also saw larger than anticipated vacancies and also longer attrition, so time to hire. 
So we had a balance in the insurances. Um, the budget assumed approximately 20 more individuals than are currently enrolled in health insurance. We hired for these paraeducator vacancies with the board support through a contract on a temporary basis. And we do have as part of our budget proposal with the support of the board um, to increase the paraeducator compensation so that we hopefully won't be in the situation where we have this level of uh, vacancies in the paraeducator line next year because we hope that we're at a competitive rate in our proposed budget if that's accepted by the town. Um, uh, let's see. So the projection assumptions that we'd continue at this rate for the remainder of the year, except for an increase of net four for the rain, remainder of the year that started in January. Um, as the experience varies, we will update the projection. It's monitored monthly and it will be reported again at Q2. With the current vacancies, the projected balance is 570,000 in health insurances. Pupil personnel, um, all special education costs are included in this category except for salaries and capital. It includes outplacement costs, settlement agreements, that's the biggest, the bulk of um, what you see here, related service needs and projected corresponding revenues. In the past, we would wait to offset the revenues. Now we've started right sizing so that when we show you the projection, we show you everything net of projected revenues so that we can keep a consistent look over time. So it includes Medicaid excess cost and the IDEA funds, which are three forms of reimbursement that we um, have for services associated with special education. Excess cost is reflected in the projection at a 70% reimbursement for those eligible expenses that are in excess of four and a half times the average per pupil expenditure. Medicaid IDEA and tuition re reimbursements are also reflected in the balances. The balance nets to 992,617. There are three main factors there. We have a surplus in transportation and special ed, as I mentioned, due to the driver shortage. Um, again, the projection has an assumption of busing at, current, at the current number of buses, but adding two six hour buses as of January 1, 2022. And I mentioned since we've added three um, buses, which we're very happy to report, um, and that will be reflected in our Q3. Also, um, lower than projected costs for OT, PT, and speech services. Thanks to a partnership with the town to issue a new RFP, the service providers in place are coming in lower than um, they had been. This was our first year of exper experience with this these providers. And not only is it being billed at a slightly lower rate, but we also are having um, being billed for less hours and we're still providing the services we need to. That's also reflected in next year's budget. Um, and we're happy to talk about that as we roll out the budget process um, this year. Um, tuition is as projected and it includes an assumption of additional out outplacements in the current year. Our um, pupil personnel and our special education team watches that because they know of individual cases that may require that. And so they, inclu they include those in their projections because as things get settled, um, sometimes children or students are outplaced later on in the year. So we, we're accounting for that. School expenses, um, this is instruction activities at the building level, includes supplies, materials, textbooks, and copying. Um, and you'll see here school expense includes you know, just there that we anticipate that we'll spend out this year. And support expenses, in support expense, it includes um, legal services. We're currently running over on our legal services um, contracts. And um, Mr. Testani um, and the executive director team are looking carefully at that. And we did build a careful proposal for next year in legal services um, as part of the budget process to bring rain in, some, bring down some of that spending. Um, it's exceeding the budget right now, partially due to new Title IX requirements and also special ed legal support. Um, and we had an in-house legal staff that um, left us. So we've had one full year of experience without that function. Um, and so it's been a little bit challenging. Um, it was challenging to predict what the cost would be this year. Um, it also includes a proposed transfer associated with the right to read legislation I mentioned earlier. And um, we do anticipate a September 2024 implementation, but we reduced our budget ask next year by stuff that we were hoping to buy this year um, as the board approves uh, a curriculum and curriculum plan. Um, net 
Next um, to last is the maintenance operation and transportation. Um, 4 million is budgeted for utilities. We typically hold this flat until we receive the winter heating bills. So we look forward to updating that in Q3. Um, the generation rates were budgeted at the contractual rates for the entire fiscal year. Um, but the contract, as the town knows, was discontinued in January and the distribution and transportation charges are not contracted and remain variable as is usage. We do expect some savings against the budget because when we budgeted last year, this time for the utilities in this year's budget, we went with the town with not knowing the, what would happen. And we were a little bit aggressive in our assumptions. So we do expect that we'll have some modest savings this year. And we did again, account for that in next year's budget, as you'll see. Um, uh, and contract over Q3, the remaining accounts we anticipate to spend full budget amount, except for a balance in plumbing and heating supplies and transportation, which I mentioned earlier, this is the non special education transportation. Um, it also re reflects proposed transfers to cover critical maintenance projects, including HVAC, um, the Tomlinson Chiller project, which came in much, much higher than we thought it would be last year. Um, we have 313,000 budgeted to for the full chiller re replacement in the ARP ESSER grant. As you remember, we reduced our budget ask last year by that amount, but it's almost double that. So this accounts for a transfer to cover that. Um, the scoreboard is going to cost a bit higher than originally projected. Um, a, a, an elevator project that was not anticipated at Fairfield Ward Middle School and technical consulting for the um, uh, like redistricting, but for lack of a better word, it's not necessarily redistricting um, the projections for what we can do uh, capacity wise to meet our students needs and facility needs. Um, Tree trimming and irrigation repair, repairs are included, security updates for window coverings, asbestos abatement, and radon remediation. Finally, capital, the capital budget is for technology equipment. Um, almost 78% of the budget, as we'd expect at this point in time, has been expended. We always hold um, some small amount of capital left over at the end of, well, for spring, for projects that um, were unanticipated, and then we can spend out the rest of the planned budget um, if, if uh, emergencies do not happen. There's an additional 200K for school and department equipment replacement, um, and those expenditures are need-based and, again, mainly purchased in the spring. Um, and in the capital line, you'll see a proposed transfer for student Chromebook replacements, server and interactive board replacements as per our five-year waterfall equipment refresh cycle, which reduced our budget ask for next year um, because we do anticipate that this is really a one-time, I mean, not one-time, <laughs> that this um, uh, will not occur again next year. Um, and so if you go to page three of 33, which I think you said it starts on 30, so that would be 33 in your packets, um, you would see um, the Q1 and Q2 side by side, high level. So I show you by what we call our major categories on the top. So it goes from personnel services to fixed charges, which includes the benefits, pupil personnel, the school expenses, Support expense, which includes those instructional materials I mentioned, maintenance, including all those projects that I mentioned, and the capital, which is for the IT for the Chromebooks and the five year refresh cycle. After all of those transfers in Q2, we would pr project a $241,000 balance. That said, um, there's a couple of things that we changed this year um, with Mr. Testani and also with the board's request and the board's support. We're not waiting until year end, which is why you're seeing more realistic projections at Q2 um, to issue all of our, um, to, to do all of our transfers. We're informing the board in real time of what we're aware of and then asking for permission to make transfers as per our policy. Um, for that reason, um, you know, we feel comfortable showing that we, we're going to be able to ideally spend out all of our money this year on appropriate expenses, board approved, and within line uh, with our policy procedures. So what you're seeing here is reflective of those transfers, but um, we would hope that that would be a zero balance at year end because we do have a lot of critical needs and things that we were able to offset in our budget request for um, this year. So I'll pause there. Um, 
I'll just say one more thing. On the bottom is the unencumbered balance. We just show this because it's part of our financial reporting. We always show what's unencumbered and we look at that, like I mentioned before, on a monthly and then show it on a quarterly basis just to make sure we're in line with what we would expect on a five-year historical, 10-year historical rolling basis for what we'd expect to see unencumbered at this point in the in time of the year followed by a summary document um, that's just historical how we showed a breakout of those major categories that um, were, uh, is our policy that we're obligated to report out on. And then following that is a series of reports generated from our Munis financial system, which is also along the lines of the major category, just a different look at it. And I'll, so now I'll pause and just ask if there are questions. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Laborious. Ms. Marmion? Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Laborious, I don't know if you're the right person to ask this, but I noticed that uh, under pupil personnel expenses, we have a, a 0.2 lower than projected costs for OTPT and speech services. Is this, um, uh, this surprises me given, you know, what we may have lost during COVID um, and given some of the special education costs, et cetera. Do we see this as a trend or do we have any um, rational, do we have any um, idea of, of what's going on there? And do you think that's trending for us? Uh, yeah, so, right. yeah, so one of the things that happened was we did go out to bid for some of these services. We saw new providers bid on the services and we saw favorable rates and favorable billing. So I, if, I, if I were to channel Rob McCusey, our Executive Director of Pupil Personal Services, I would say that the needs of our students are great. Um, we are still complying with our mandated legal requirements um, and are happy to provide support to all of our students. And we don't see um, a lowering in the need at this moment, nor in our projected budget. We did see a decrease in costs associated with being billed for less hours um, and some right potential right sizing due to issuing an RFP for those services. And, and if I could. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. It's Jeff Peterson for the board of ed. Um, I, I really want to echo what Ms. Laboria said about, I don't want to extract trend from this in terms of our need. I would okay. be very cautious to do that based on shorter term uh, contracted expenses, not necessarily reflecting what the long-term needs are going to be over the next few years. That's helpful. Um, just one follow up question, and it has to do with the paraprofessional. So, are we meeting our our um, our the IEP, the the contractual needs with the paraprofessionals, or are we short of the a uh, short of what we need uh, to meet the students' needs? So, if I could answer, just I'll answer from a budget perspective, and I'd be happy to follow up with additional information. Um, I, I would suggest that Mr. McCusey would say that we're meeting our, our legal needs and requirements. I would suggest that he would probably say that it's been challenging. One of the things that the board did ask us, allow us to do was while we were experiencing the paraeducator shortage, we were able to shift over to a contract for those vacant positions. So for behavioral therapists, which meet the same requirements as our educators. Oh, Mr. Testani wants to say something. I'm sorry, let me <laughs> pause. <laughs> Uh, um, we are meeting the needs of all the students IEPs. Um, the, the, the good part about Fairfield is that we are um, well staffed when it comes to student support in the classroom, when it comes to paraprofessionals. Um, so students that require in their IEP a one on one paraprofessional or additional para support um, come first in our priorities. And then we will categorize and prioritize from there. So um, we are meeting the needs. Could we do a little bit better on some of our non mandated paraprofessional services? Yes. Um, but we are meeting the needs of our special education students. Thanks very well, much. And we also see, uh, in addition, you know, the vacancies that we had on the board side, so FTE vacancies, just from a factual standpoint. Um, we hired that many contractors, so we were able to, you know, work agilely to get um, needed staff in through the contract through the board's cooperation um, this year. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marmion. And can I just, I see other board members that just have questions, but if, if I could just ask a follow up on Ms. Marmion's question. Um, and Ms. Laborious, I was, I was gonna ask about the paras when you started talking through your memo, because um, I, I do recall from our last meeting that you said you were hired, you had hired contracted paras, which I thought I recalled were more expensive than permanent employees. And yet you talked here about the fact that the shortage in paras was saving us money. So I was a little confused there. Sure. Yeah. So um, the shortage of paras is saving us money on that personnel line because there are vacancies on the personnel line and we're paying for them out of the people. Got it. Okay. Line. I remember. Yeah, so net net, right. They are more expensive um, when you account for the benefits. So you'll also see some savings on the, on the health insurance side, for example, because when we pay the contractors, um, we're not paying for those benefits directly. Thank you. I, now that I'm, I'm thinking about it, I think you probably explained that to us last quarter and I forgot. So thank you. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of moving parts in this this in this budget this year. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Dewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, um, and Ms. Laborious. Thank you for the report. Um, I just want to be clear on on a number on page four of thirty three. In the sweat expenses, that that fifth number in the row is a is a reduction at two point six million dollars. I'm sorry, I, I miss, I, I apologize, Mr. DeWitt. You were asking about uh, which I couldn't hear the full question. Like 16 on the spec expenses. Okay. The uh -huh. number is a reduction in the need. 2,604,943. Oh, no, it's just a different way to look at it. So what this is saying is, and I should have probably walked you through it. Um, the original budget was 14.8. I'm just starting with um, the first column. The revised budget was 15.5. Mm -hmm. We've spent 8.6 year to date. Our encumbrances and requisitions are totaling 9.9 .9 million against uh, that budget. Projected additional obligations are negative 2.6 because we've got to adjust that revenue. So if you added the current budget, plus the year-to-date actuals, plus the additional encumbrances and requisitions offset by that adjustment, it equals a projected balance of 445. Did I explain that clear? So because of the fact that we wait to adjust that revenue, which again, next year, we're not gonna do that, but we do show it to you in the projection live. So that big number is that excess cost revenue um, that we resolve in March, but we do have a projected number. But unlike other years, you're projecting this budget not run over by millions of dollars. That's correct. Yeah, I, that's correct. I just wanted to take a second to, to thank you and please tell Mr. Mancusi the same thing. Um, we we made a real investment last year and it was tough to give you the extra money, but I think that's really paid off. And, you know, since I and the guy every quarter complaining about that number being negative. I, I don't want to be the guy that doesn't say I'm very happy that it's that it's positive now. And um, to hear about going out for contract for OT and PT expenses. Uh, I, I think that's really what you guys should be doing and you're doing it. So yeah. you know, I, I appreciate that. So thank yeah, you. And they're also right now evaluating an RT, our, um, RFP for consult consultations. So that's with um, Mr. McCusey and that was in collaboration with the town. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when we talk about the purchasing policy next week, you know, I'd like to know how, how you went out for bid for that. Was that a, was that a real no kidding three bids? Uh, we didn't sole source that we didn't bid waiver it, any of that stuff. So, you know, we don't have to belabor the, it here, but um, just thank you. And, and, and I think it'd be a great point to discuss next week. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Walsh. Good evening, Ms. Laborious. Thanks for being here. I just have a couple of questions. Um, let me get to that. I guess it's on um, page three of 33, which is the projected balance page from Q1 to Q2. So at the end of Q1, we had a projected balance of 2,647. And in one quarter, we eat up 91% of that. 
and we're now only going to have a projected balance of 241, 366, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. Out of the main areas where some of the funds came from, which are immediately above that in lines five, six, and seven, where it's 540,466 for support services, maintenance operation line of you know, using 959,247 transfer into that and also an, a near million dollar transfer into capital. How much of those funds would have you been seeking for like your next year's budget? Is there savings in the budget that's been the board has approved that really you respent? Yes. How much of that amount of money have you respent? for the next year's budget, for the 24 fiscal year? So I'm gonna answer this carefully because I don't wanna misspeak. So um, a projection is a projection. So we are still, as of this report in Q2, a little bit early in the year. Um, that said, um, what we are assuming in this Q2 budget was about $2 million of spending that would have been offset from needs for next year that in, well let me let me restate this let me restate this two million dollars of transferred spending of which in this proposal it reflects four hundred and fifty thousand dollars that we would have otherwise needed next year for literacy to come in line with literacy um ne uh, needs per the csd legislation so what you see is a phased in approach so 450k is for the literacy um, there's a million dollars of pre-buying here in this budget for a five-year refresh plan on the IT side. The board has only authorized transfers for that thus far of 600,000 because we're still only in Q2 when they authorized the transfers. They paused on the auth authorization of the transfer for the 450 while we work to finalize and develop the product that we're, products and, and approach that we're recommending. And then the third piece is there's a million dollars here assumed in needed funds for uh, maintenance and uh, facility projects. Um, so some of that would have ha had to have been part of the request for next year. And some of it is just critical things that came up this year that we're, we don't want to pause other projects that we're working on. So I would answer that by saying a million of it is IT that did reduce our IT ask. Um, 450,000 did reduce our um, ask on the curricular side, curriculum, textbook materials. And then um, on the maintenance side, these are new things that came up that we feel we need to do. So what was the Board of Education's approved percentage increase for the 24 fiscal year? For next fiscal year, at 4.05% is their proposed budget. What would it have been, been if this $2 million had not been transferred on this $2 million of stuff that was, we're really using a balance from this, well, projected balance, it's agreed. You know, I think, I want to be careful. What, what would it have been? Yeah. I'll say what a million dollars is worth in terms of a percent. A million is a half a percent. But a budget is a series of priorities. So I believe, you know, I don't want to speak for Mr. Tosconi who, who's here. I don't know that we would have come to the town with a high ask. Um, you know, I think that we would have worked with the board to prioritize a pro what we felt was an appropriate budget to put forward. Um, but it did it did help tremendously to be able to do pre-purchase some of these things this year. Purchase of technology was that supposed to be spread out over five years? The million dollars? It's it's the portion that we would need for next year for capital purchases of a five year refresh plan. Five year refresh plan is five million dollars, of of which you took a million dollars of your your what looked like a proposed surplus. Uh, and you are taking a 20% of that one year's worth. So a million dollars towards the refresh program and pre-purchasing that in this fiscal year. Correct. Yeah, that includes um, interactive boards, servers, um, some faculty laptops and mainly Chromebooks for students. So Chromebooks have a life, uh, life cycle of six years and we're in one-to-one -one right now. 
Um, next year's budget only funds um, the increases by grade for grade six and grade nine. And now getting down to the capital amounts, mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's still maintenance operation and transportation. You have in here like an overrun, I guess, on this fancy scoreboard that was budgeted for last year. That was going to be able to show all sorts of stuff, right? Like, you know, help with graduation, maybe put people's photos up there during graduation and your ads. There was a whole marketing plan to help you know, offset this and bring in a revenue value for the town. So yeah. how much overrun is there on that fancy scoreboard? I'm just looking for that document now, if you'll just bear with me, because I did have it up earlier. And and Mr. Walsh, just to specify, uh, and Ms. Laborious will correct me if, if I'm mistaken here, uh, that when we went through the budget last year, that was still a proposal. Um, we thought that the amount that was appropriated uh, would either cover a scoreboard uh, from a particular company that uh, we could possibly offset with with market with advertising expense, or a, a regular you know kind of dumb scoreboard. Um, it, 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 as it happens, the smart scoreboard is is not the way that we're going. Um, oh. so so out of the money that was supposed to be spent on the what you call a smart scoreboard, we're not doing that. And it's just like a kind of an overrun on what the dumb scoreboard will be now. <laughs> I don't know that I would. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I'm not sure I would characterize it as a dumb. I just it, it, versus. What did you call it? I'm just trying to use your oh, language. No, no, no. And, and that's and that's look, and that's entirely fair. But you know, and this this got caught up last year. I, I think there was some confusion. There was a proposal for highly interactive scoreboard. We were excited about the possibility of it. We didn't know at the time, even during budget season, whether that was going to pan out. Um, and and as, it, as it happens, I understand Mr. Bob George should be able to explain in more detail. We are not going in that direction. Yeah. Okay. We we did work with the town to um, issue an RFP for that. So it's it what we have now reflects the best pricing. Um, uh, I believe um, based on that request for proposal, they did go back and forth and have some negotiation. Um, and it does include a $70,000 reimbursement from the state through ARPA funds. Um, so this is the net difference between what the board put in the budget. They did reduce the board budget based on that $70,000, if you recall it year end. And so it includes the board budget plus the 70 plus we need additional. I, I apologize, I can't find the document, but it's about 100K. So total, it's it's just under 300,000, I believe. And this smart, smart scoreboard, as we had discussed, I think last budget season, we were probably going to have to be doing one at Ludlow, correct? At a further time period in order so that they would have equal services at each school, correct? I believe that was part of the conversation that said it's not in next year's budget. I think what they are working with right now is adequate for another year. Um, and so we have a dumb scoreboard now. Maybe we could keep it for a while. I don't. <laughs> well, also, it's intended to be revenue generating, so um, not in the first year, but um, as it generates revenue, I, I believe the assumption was that some of that revenue would be set aside to purchase the additional scoreboard. But I, I can get back to you on that because I, I don't want to misspeak. It, it changed a few times. Are we now, since we're not going with the smart scoreboard and sticking with more of a normal scoreboard or dumb scoreboard, whatever we want to call it? Are we not going to have the revenue source? Is that whole revenue source thing now gone? Oh, Mr. Testani wants to. I just wanted to. Defer. <laughs> no, we will have the opportunity to um, to sell ad space on on the digital scoreboard. That will be a, a possibility with the with the scoreboard that we will be installing. Um, I guess it's not as high tech as the one. Uh, right. That was discussed last year, but it does have the capability of selling ad space to generate income for the Board of Education. Does that mean we will be investing in another scoreboard for the Ludlow field? This is for Ludlow. Um, so so down, down the road, I have not had any discussions. It has not been brought to my attention of one for Fairfield Ward as of right now. Oh. Um, last, 
um, Mr. Testani, I apologize. I know you're, you're, you're new, but there was discussion that we would probably have to be upgrading the other scoreboard, I guess, at Ward then. I'm sure that will be a discussion that will be had in the future, um, but that has not been brought to any to my attention as of yet. And I do think that if we're going to um, upgrade the scoreboard, um, that we will have to see some revenue generated from the one at Ludlow to invest in uh, replacing the one at Ward. And if I could just add from the, from the board standpoint, just yeah, this came up in in terms of equity between the facilities yes um, as, as opposed to you know this must be done at this particular time we we did discuss that in last year's budget season um but that's the that's the context in which i would i would think about this not that the ward scoreboards are failing which as i understand they are not um but the clear priority is to is to is to replace the ludlow scoreboard and what does that do for kind of long-term planning to make sure that our facilities are, are relatively equivalent, at least as interesting as it may be. Okay. Uh, is this type of scoreboard we're using um, dependent on what type of revenue we generate for, from advertising, or is it pretty much going to be the same? We're not going to lose any revenue based on the scoreboard we've decided to go with. There were different models that they looked at. Um, and so, at the end of the day, it was what was considered to be most affordable with the biggest bang for your buck, <laughs> I believe. So, um, I don't know, but we can give you some more update on the specs. Oh, Mike, did you want to? Yeah, I just think, you know, the, the revenue will be generated and be dependent on um, whether we can find someone, um, a third provider to be able to sell this the ad space or whether we have the capability to do that in-house. Um, and be able to maximize how how much revenue can be generated. I don't know if we have anyone on staff that has the expertise to sell ad space. Um, that was a conversation that I had with the two athletic directors um, to see if there were capability for th those folks to be able to go out there and 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 sell ad space, or whether it's going to be something where a third a third person provider will have to do that, and then you know obviously they'll take a cut or a commission on the ad space that's sold. So that's that's really going to be dependent on which way we have to go. Uh, Miss Laborious, what was the biggest surprise you found between Q1 and Q2 that you were surprised about? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, hmm. The continued um, the trajectory with the retirees this year, I guess, Q1, when we really looked at it and drilled in, that that was shocking to me. Um, so we spent a lot of time looking at the numbers and do, the regression analysis for next year. Um, that really surprised me. And that the effects of the pandemic continued to impact. We really thought we would see, I don't know, industry-wide, I don't know if I can speak for others, but I, I I did think we would see a return more return to normalcy in terms of the numbers and and we didn't see that this year. Um, we're seeing it more now, but I'm um, just you know the fact that we had the level of vacancies that we did was surprising to me. Trajectory on the retirements continuing at what they are now, or do you think that they're they've we've hit up you know the worst of it? And then it's going to start getting a little better. Yeah, I think it will start getting better. I, I mean, I can't bet a hundred percent because yeah. last year, but um, we we did. I did get an update today, and we only had six um, year to date that had come in. And we always keep an eye on who's in pipeline, so also who's coming to have conversations with HR to find out information. And that number was two, so that's much lower than the last two years what we had seen at the same point in time. So that said, it, it looks like. Knock on wood that hopefully it's trending more in a normal direction. We're going to retain some of the, you know, qualified, talented staff that are with us longer and more seasoned. And um, hopefully that's writing itself a little bit more. Clearly, I don't have to look at this the way you do, but it would seem as though if there's been heavy retirements at some point, we're going to start running out of people qualified to retire. Correct. At, at a certain yeah, we do. We run a regression analysis for males and females with a look back, um, and we we run the regression analysis on the actual numbers of people within age bands now. You know now, 
that are on our stuff. And yeah, we're, we're, we're younger, you know, than we were. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, you cut out. Are you, you're all set? Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, I'm all done with my questioning of, of Ms. Laborious and thank you, Ms. Laborious and to Mr. Testani for, for, for your candid responses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Testani. Yeah, I think you're muted. Mr. Testani, are you trying to speak? Yes, sorry. I just was going to say be, when the Board of Ed is on, we may have to differentiate between Mr. Michael Testani and Mr. <laughs> Jack Testani. I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. But um, first of all, Ms. Laboris, thank you for coming. I, I think to, miss, to uh, echo Mr. DeWitt's sentiments from earlier, I'm a little surprised in addition to the amount of increase of retirees, uh, the the reporting on the on um, SPED is um, well uh, is a welcome report. Let's put it that way. So, I think in terms of you being surprised, that that certainly is one I know myself personally, and I from what Mr. Dewitt said, he was pleasantly surprised as well. So that that's a good thing. But I do have a couple questions on the IT piece of the budget, and I know that a lot of what you were talking about, smart boards and things. And you know, I know we've discussed this at other meetings, but just if you don't mind, either you or perhaps Mr. Peterson can refresh my memory on how the board goes about uh, requesting purchasing those items. And let me tell you why, because uh, one of the things I'm familiar with is that there are grant opportunities for potentially, and I'm not saying for every case, but certainly for some of the hardware, perhaps even the uh, the Chromebooks, I know occasionally there are donations that are made. So I'm trying to understand, can some of those costs be offset at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we currently do um, uh, apply for and receive an E-rate rebate for eligible items from the state. Um, it's a significant amount of money that offsets, you know, Wi-Fi servers and other hardware. And I can get that number for you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, like when you say others, like like the Chromebooks, the Chromebooks. I don't know if they're an eligible expense. I can't recall, but I can I can they're, find out. They are not. They're not, Mike. Okay. They are not. Funny, yeah. And, and in terms of donations, that that ship has has sailed through the pandemic. Um, to to try to go and solicit do donations for for laptops and Chromebooks right now is almost impossible. What, why would you say that? I'm just curious. Have you is that is that something that perhaps not you personally, but the Board of Ed has tried to uncover? Mike, do you mind me? Throughout the, Mike, we're both yeah. Mr. Pistani? Yeah, well, throughout the pandemic, it was something that most of the larger school districts in the state um, were challenged in being able to provide one to one devices. Um, there was a major donation at that time um, with the uh, Dalio Foundation in partnership with the state. Right. That that partnership has dissolved um, at this point. And, you know, to try to go out now and solicit for technology, which which I, I did in my previous district, in addition to the Dalio um, donation, which only was for high school students. Uh, it, was, it was very challenging to be able to it do It was that. specific to the Chromebooks, if I recall correctly. Is that right? Well, it was, no, it was actually um, laptops. They were, um, they were HP laptops that were donated. Um, okay. Wanted something a little bit more sophisticated because it was only for grades 9 through 12. All right, gotcha. Okay. And we did utilize a grant for our 9 to 12. Um, if you'll recall, two years ago, like during the pandemic, um, to purchase laptops at the high school level. And then coming from a different district, the districts that are Alliance districts were given a lot of priority for those Chromebook grants. And again, that that's didn't extend to Fairfield at the time. Right now, and I understand. And just moving forward, is that um, someone's responsibility within the, the Board of Ed itself, Ms. Laborious? Is that you personally, I know, uh, 
that there are people like on the town side that pursue potential grant opportunities. I'm just trying to figure out how that works on the Board of Ed side. Yeah, so we do have a grants coordinator. The grants coordinator um, facilitates all the applications for the grants on the finance side and works with our assistant superintendent for our title grants and our, but she also pursues um, the most Medicaid reimbursement that we can get, for example, by really ensuring that we're following all the protocols for documentation. Bigger grants, we do not, but I, I you know, Mr. Testani and I can talk about it because it is something that I've experienced in other districts where, where we do have staff that do go out and look for other private grants for things that um, can't supplant work that were being done at the Board of Ed, but um, could certainly provide additional opportunities. That said, we do have, you know, fees that we charge that offset some expenses that are not considered base operations. So parking, um, gate fees at athletic events, for example, um, some of the summer school programs that we offer to um, students are fee-based. Um, in addition, we do receive some small grant funding for very specific things that are done in the schools. But I, I'd be happy to, you know, think about that. And with Mr. Tassani's support, we'll think about how we might leverage that. Um, yeah, that would be great if you could look into that. And the other piece uh, sort of to go along with Mr. Walsh's uh, questions on our smart or, or dumb scoreboard, uh, however you want to categorize it. I do know that there's also other communities, uh, and I forgive me, I don't recall if they're referred to as booster clubs, touchdown clubs, you know, however you want to think about it, but there are uh, other, and they may not necessarily be in our derg, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, that raise money uh, for advertised through advertising. Mm -hmm. for like a board like what uh, Mr. Walsh and what we've all been talking about in the past. I, I think we may have had this conversation at another meeting, but I just want to throw that out there that there are ways that other communities do try to generate revenue when it comes to field signage and, and could specifically be applied to a potential smart scoreboard. I think we'll stay with the word smart maybe this conversation okay <laughs> no that's a good point and we're also we met with a sister district um recently to look at um leveraging our current um infinite campus product because you can open up a, for free a store where you can do some of the stuff that's happening in the student activity and or the booster accounts that run through the schools if it's not a, a separate entity um or the booster type accounts. And you can run that through Infinite Campus, so it makes it a little bit easier. So we're looking to leverage that if we can in the next, you know, for next year. So more to come on that. And the board's also looking at policies related to um, the booster clubs and student activities, as well as fundraising and, and gifts, grants, and bequests. So okay. we're looking at all of that now at this, at this moment. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Mr. Testani. Any other questions from board members? Okay, well, thank you very much, Ms. Laborious. Appreciate, um, appreciate you being here and all the information. Thank you, Mr. Testani, and we will see you soon. I guess uh, March 9th is the date for budget hearings. Yep, Great. Look so forward fun. to it. All right, yeah, it's gonna be a, <laughs> <laughs> gonna be a blast, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. See you then. Take care. Thank you. All right. We will move on to uh, item six to review the town's fiscal year 23 Q2 financial update. Uh, motion to hear this item. Uh, Mr. DeWitt seconded by Mr. Curley. Thank you. All right. So um, the materials for this item begin on page. 63 of the posted backup. Um, we have um, Ms. Caitlin Bossy, the town controller. Welcome. Thanks for taking us through this. Sure. I'm not sure if um, I think Mr. Schmidt might have a conflict right now. So I'll, uh, I'll go through the best I can. And if there's any questions for him, he could maybe circle up later. I think he's on the RTM meeting right now. Um, but if you want to start off on the summary page, like we normally do, We'll just talk about, let me just 
skip to the bottom line, uh, the estimated increase in fund balance went up 2.9, as you guys probably saw. Um, the big elephant in the room is the investment income. And luckily, Ms. Trabuco uh, very eloquently talked about what rates have done in, in, in the past uh, six to eight months. So, um, but if we start on the revenue side, like we always do, we'll just kind of go down um, investment income number two. Um, the current prior year uh, levy and interest remained the same as it did in Q1. That's basically the 500,000 that we talked about in Q1, which was the, um, the tax credits, the senior tax relief that came up, I believe it was late in the budget cycle last year. Um, so that's the same 500. Just to let you know, because we get collection reports from the tax collector every month, um, we're just under 1% under higher than we were at the same time last year. So we're, we're kind of flat, but as you guys know, the collection rate increased from fiscal 22 to 23 from 98.71 to 98.9. So I'm keeping the, the, the current year levy numbers kind of the same and really just projecting out the, the 500, which was the senior tax credit relief that um, was, was spoken about in Q1. So not a lot of um, variance on the collection piece for the levy, levy part of our, uh, our income statement here. The investment income, um, we're projecting $2 million. Um, as you guys know, the feds have raised their rates numerous times, actually five times uh, during fiscal 23. Since March 17th, so almost a year ago, we were at 0.25%, just to give you some semblance of an idea, we're now at 4.75%. So um, I believe you, when you guys talked about your budget last year of this, of this interest, we budgeted about 628, and I think it was a conservative number. I think that was spoken about last year. So how this 2 million came to be, just to give you a little bit of input, um, we looked at actuals. We have actuals through January, because now that we're in February, we've actually done our mark-to-market, our quarterly mark-to-market and our interest. We are at 1.4, which is the actual as of January. So I projected out a February to be similar to January, um, for the month of February, just to give you a feel, um, it's at 350. That's where we were actual for January. We reached out to our new investment advisors, Jannie, and we said, hey, what's, what's your projection? We gave you all this money in March through June 30. What are you projecting our net interest with our fair market value to be? And they said another million. So if you add up those three numbers, um, it comes to be about 2.7 million is what we're projecting for um, interest and the fair market values for fiscal 23. So we have a budget of 627. So we're, we're comfortable with the $2 million favorable investment income number um, for fiscal 23. So that's the largest variance on, on this quarterly report as of now. Um, again, it's, it's assuming no real rate hikes again, um, after the one we just had February 1st, because most of this has been built into our bond prices. But that's, that's the $2 million number. That's how we came up with the $2 million number in conjunction with our investment advisors. Um, the, the one conveyance uh, reached out to the town clerk. As you guys probably know, inventory is a little low. Refinancing is a little bit down due to the, the spikes in the interest rates. Um, so she's projecting a slight um, unfavorable variance of $100,000. Um, just to put it into com some context, I did look at the 24 budget and there was a decrease in conveyance and reporting fees of about 300. So it is kind of um, in line with what we're thinking is going on in the market from this point forward. Um, next line, building permits. Um, slightly favorable and I really should have put building permits next to fire marshal fees because they kind of go hand in hand, but um, projecting about 100,000 favorable for both. Um, they've had some large projects come in this fiscal year to date. Um, the four largest ones were Ash Creek Apartments over um, on the Ash Creek side of town near Fairfield Avenue over there. There was a large dorm at Fairfield U, there was a large dorm at Sacred Heart, and the St. Catherine School over on Taymor Drive has a major uh, renovation going on. So um, it, it has been favorable so far. 
So there's some smaller ones they know coming down the pike, but they're both building permits and fire marshal fees are projecting about 100,000 favorable in, in revenue this year. Uh, the one in between park and rec revenue went up from 230 to 579, largely due to two things. Um, one being golf, it was a pretty mild winter. Um, so through December, they're estimating their golf to be up about $200,000, um, just to let you know, um, for part three and uh, Smith Rich fees. And in the, the detail of the revenue pieces, you'll see there's a little bit ups and downs with the carts and stuff, but they're netting out to about 200,000 favorable in revenue for the golf. And the other difference is due to the Burr Mansion that the town took over. Um, we had some parties on the books that came over from when the museum managed it. We're, we're netting out to be about 196 in revenue, which, which of course wasn't budgeted. And on the flip side, there's expenses related to those tents and having all the festivities there and part-time payroll of about 64. So Burmanton this year, they're projecting to be a favorable 130,000. So that's the two largest swings in the park and rec revenue. Um, going down a couple lines, state revenue was kind of flat from what we thought. There was just some actual amounts that came in slightly higher, about $100,000 higher than where we were in Q1, um, largely due to those state payments that we spoke about in Q1, um, which was the uh, municipal revenue share revenue from the state. And that's already in, in the bank. Those, that's already, that's a done deal. Lastly, the other went from zero to a 257 favorable, um, largely due to Storm Ida. We're still getting money back from the feds and FEMA. That was about 120 of that that we received in Q2. Um, a small CURMA rebate of about $60,000 and some senior center classes and membership that they're now charging for through the senior center of about 50. Um, and just to follow up on that, there is a there is a budgeted amount in 24 for those of about 83,000. So that really makes up the bulk of the other favorable expenses. There's a lot of other smaller ones that you guys could see on the revenue detail sheets, um, some ins and outs. Um, so basically the revenue is up from the expected one eight to almost like the four six, um, largely mainly due to the investment income. Does anyone have any questions on the revenue or could I flip it over to the expense? Um, we can take questions on revenue. Do any, any, any questions from the board on the revenue side? Mr. Curley? Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and hi, Caitlin. Good to see you tonight. And thanks for your detailed presentation. As always, you always provide a lot of line out of detail and it's very helpful. Um, I just want to confirm on the uh, investment income line, obviously biggest driver. If I heard you correctly, some of that $2 million was related to January or February activity. Just wanted to understand that. Okay, so we're, our, so we had through January actuals done reconciled to the statements for all of our investments. It was a $1.4 million actual number. Just to give it some context, our budget for the whole year is 627. Yep. Okay, so we were favorable, whatever the difference is. So I took January. I kind of assumed February was going to be like January, just not knowing and knowing that the rates have kind of been flat since February 1st, um, projected at 350, because that's what our actual was in January. Yeah. From March 1 through June 30, we are projecting to move our investments over to our investment advisor. So giving, they know all of our bonds, all of our CDs, where all of our money is, what the maturity dates are, what the rates are. They're projecting a million dollars from March through June. So if you add up those three numbers, that is a $2.7 million number. And I'm just rounding, we have about 700,000 in the budget. So that, that's, that's my 2 million favorable. Yeah, that's helpful. I appreciate that color. That kind of puts the pieces together. And the, I'm going to re repeat a comment that I made last quarter uh, when you provided an update. Um, I I just struggle with these updates to the extent that 
this statement reads as of December 31st, and yet it contains activity through January, including activity in January and February. Um, I, I get that if that's the process the town follows, I'm not suggesting that you change your process. But if I were a, a resident um, or, or just someone interested in looking at these financials and where we stand, I would expect a, a statement that goes through December 31st of 22 um, to, to reflect activity through the fourth, uh, I guess our fiscal second quarter and not, and not include activity in, from January and February. So, uh, so uh, it's just a comment, that's all. So to follow up on that, so the munis reports that you have are through December. So you can see the actual through December. Now, I think I would be amiss if I'm not taking any real time actual numbers that I know into account. So, and I can't get through December, through, through February for every account because there's a lag, right? So I can't even get through February. So when expenses hit real time, but a lot of this revenue is on a lag and, and I can't get everything to any point in time. So I'm just trying to make you guys up to date with the most real time knowledge that I have. But those ministry parts are as of December. I think I would be amiss if I took December and I kind of disregarded my actuals when I had knowledge for January and took that into consideration. So and, hence and maybe, my title, but period ending June 30. So this is an estimated variance report through the fiscal year with the best knowledge that I have on every single account. Oh, uh, okay. That's, that's fine. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Curley. Caitlin, can I just ask a follow up question on the investment income? Sure. So, um, how much of that, um, $2 million is, uh, or, or the, I forget the 2 million, cause that's the, the variance out of the total investment income. Um, how much of that is actual cash, like CDs, you know, interest that we've actually earned that's in the bank versus how much of this is, it sounds like we've got some unrealized gains in there on bonds that we, you know, end up holding to maturity. So what, what's the actual kind of hard cash number in investment income that we're earning, if you know? We, we have, we have obviously, as you know, various, we have money market accounts, right. we have yeah. We have $28 million in SIF making about 4.5 right now, which is the state um, investment vehicle, right? So that's, that's where I'll, 28 million is. Um, we have three, just to give you a feel, really truly investment type of accounts. We have Ameriprise, US Bank, and Janney. To give you a feel, those have the bonds, the CDs, the rest are money markets for the most part. And we have some at people for our operating. Um, just to give you a feel, as of, as of January, the bank statements for those three, which, which really have the bonds and the CDs, was $66 million, just to give you some sense of the amount of money that's really... Out of, so I'm sorry, but I guess out of what? So what, what percentage of our investments are actually earning like, um, you know, cash interest versus, because I'm always, you know, the bonds, again, I know we typically hold them to maturity, so we have a coupon yeah. that's getting paid, but we also have unrealized gains and losses in there at times. So I'm just, I'm trying to separate the unrealized piece and, and trying to understand out of our investment income, how much of that actually is cash interest that we're earning. I mean, and if you don't know exactly, that's fine. I just, is it three quarters of it, 90% of it? I'm just, that's that's what I was trying to so, get to. So in, so in rough figures, the 66 million is the, is the ending January statements for those three accounts that we have to do a mark to market for. Um, our overall cash, you know, obviously, which fluctuates really daily, um, there's maybe 120 million. Okay, so like half of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I heard you say we were averaging something like four and three quarters on our money. Well, that's at SIF. Okay. Yeah. So, which so is we pretty have great. Million dollars <laughs> at SIF, so yeah. that's okay. that's. For four and a, four and a half, or you know, that fluctuates every day as well. But I think that my most recent one I saw was four point six three, okay. and that's twenty eight million. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Walsh. You, you had a question. So, first of all, um, 
Mr. Curley, I understood your last question. I that it says, you know, it's a certain second quarter, but I think, you know, personally, I I appreciate the way it's done because I don't want to be at a meeting like this and get the end of the um December 31st number, but the finance department knows we have some huge major expenses and we're all like thinking everything is rosy. And then we wait for another three months. And I would feel like, to be honest with you, I'd feel like they were fraudulent statements that you didn't tell me that you knew about $3 million of overages somewhere that just happened. So I think um, we've always kind of, at least since I've been on the board, looked at it. Um, the way that Mrs. Bossy explained, where if she knows something, <laughs> it's really she's looking at what she's predicting to be, and the finance department's looking at what they're predicting to be, what the surplus might be through June 30th, as far as we know that, based on the numbers through the 31st, but also things that they know about. So I appreciate it, and I would like that. To Personally, as this individual member, would like that to continue because I think that I leave this meeting feeling like I have a pretty good prediction from the finance department of where this is heading. Um, that's one thing. The second uh, question, and I guess it's more of a request, is that this hundred and twenty million dollars that we're making the interest on, I would like to know a breakout of where the individual sections of this are coming. What part of it is fund balance? What part of it is could be the bonds that we issued? Like, are we spending all those bonds that the bond money that we had? Are we going to be spending that through year end, or is that just we've changed our mind and that just cash that's sitting in the bank someplace being invested? So I had the opportunity over the weekend to look at the posted. Uh, budget coming up and that number for interest is high as well. And I just going forward to prepare for the meetings, I would like to get a breakdown of the $120 million, what it consists of in different areas. So I have some sense of it. And if you could supply that to the rest of the board, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Walsh. I appreciate that comment. I think um, when we had our, our sort of budget brainstorming meeting, um, I think we actually put that specific request in for um, investment income was to actually show the calculation. So the, because we had a lot of debate about it and there was a lot of back and forth last year. So just in the interest of saving time, we did ask for that. The, the additional part that you asked for, though, um, I don't think for Frank's per, was, was something that we specified, which, you know, I think what we were what we asked for for the budget was, you know, what's our portfolio? and show us how how the how you're calculating the interest for the budget which you i think also asked for and i just want to clarify is that portfolio is sits where you know x amounts in a capital projects account because it's bonded x amount is fund balance x amount is our normal checking account balance so that to me would be sort of a separate piece of it but um frank are you are you kind of clear on that I just want to make sure I, I think it's a it's a good idea but I just want to make sure we're all clear on what's being requested yes as I understand it and, and we've and we've talked about it in preparing for the budget meeting but essentially of, of the amount we have in, in invested where is it coming from is I guess the simply put way as I understand it yeah, yeah. and I, yeah. I think the simplest way is show the calculation of interest yeah. show the calculation of the amount that goes into the budget based on what our portfolio looks like, but, you know, to Mr. Walsh's point, you know, we know X amount of that, you know, we have, I don't know what our fund balance is now, $40 million or something like that. But I think Caitlin talked about something like 120 million that we're earning interest on. So where are all those other pieces? Where do they kind of sit in our balance sheet? Like what is ARPA? Obviously we got funded on ARPA money and it's sitting there waiting to be spent. And I know a lot of it's gonna be spent in the next 12 months and that's fair. So, you know, but what are the other pieces that make up $120 million that we're about to give to a financial institution so that I have some understanding of what that consists of? Yeah. Because yeah. I traditionally think about it as fund balance, but it's a lot greater than fund balance. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more. So I would like to get some sense as we head into the budget season. 
for revenue. Thank you. Understood. Yep, thank you. Great, great point, Mr. Walsh. Appreciate it. Um, any other questions on revenue? Okay, um, expenses, Caitlin? Okay, um, going down to expenses, the vacancy churn number remains somewhat flat um, at 750. We have some, you know, vacancies now, and it's just the churn. Um, some of the vacancies that that I've been seeing and, and asking people about, we have an open space manager, we have a DPW finance person, we have one firefighter, one police officer, a building inspector, two laborers that are starting this week, and an assistant purchasing director. And basically the rest is, is, is churn, is having an opening for a couple months in a certain area, possibly hiring someone at a lower cost um, than, than what was in there. So, um, that 750 kind of kind of stayed the same. Uh, park and rec expense, um, we kind of touched on the on the revenue piece. The expense kind of follows the golf and for mansion. Um, for mansion, 64,000 of that, um, as it was unbudgeted, and the rest is um, you know needing more people at the golf courses due to increased play. So that's the jump of about 116,000. Um, the other favorable, that's a favorable 294. Um, as you, there's, it, it's, it's itemized out on the, on the uh, variance report that breaks it out by account. Um, but just to summarize, some of the bigger ones are unemployment. Um, we're projecting about $100,000 favorability there. It's really low so far this year. Um, just to give you some sense, through Q2, we've spent $59,000. Um, budget is 250. So just to give you some sense of, of that, that's probably the biggest. And our mild winter so far probably accounts on the snowing, lower gas, lower electricity rates, um, another 180. And due to the vacancies and churn, we had a smaller contribution to our 401A of about 50,000 in savings on there. So those are the biggest pieces, um, but you can see there's some ins and outs on the uh, expenditure variance report. Um, but those are the biggest ones that make up the 294. So on the expense side, not a lot has changed. We're a little more favorable by about 180. So if you add the 180 to the favorable revenue of 27, we're, we're close to a 2.9 um, favorable variance from Q1 to Q2. Thank you. Questions on expenses? Anyone? I, I do have one other footnote if no one has oh, expense, sure. uh, expense. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, so ECC, I kind of footnoted down at the bottom, um, might have a, a savings due to the timing of the Westport folks coming on board to our new regional uh, Fairfield County Dispatch Center. We don't know the exact amount um, yet. I believe that they've been onboarded, but the police department are on the call um, if you guys want to ask them any questions. So we just don't have a, a really a figure yet to put up top. So I kind of footnoted it down below just so that there's no surprises going through Q3 and Q4. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So savings due to estimated timing, does that mean Westport came on board earlier than we thought or what, what does that mean? Well, so so I mean, the police could talk about a little bit more detail, but just to give you some background on the budgeting stuff, you guys remember, so we took ECC is now its own fund. Right. And 23. The only thing budgeted we have in general funds is the Fairfield two thirds estimated expense piece, which is about 1.7 million. Yep. So the 1.7 would be a funding source to where all the expenses are kind of falling into that new fund. So as these um, employees didn't onboard until later, there's going to be some savings. How much we're not sure yet, because there's basically three funding pieces just to just to give you a quick little summary before the police jump in and talk about the details. There was the Westport funding piece, the Fairfield funding piece, and a smaller state funding piece. So um, our piece was the 1.7, Westport was budgeted at about a million and the difference being coming from the state. So the state is still giving us our smaller E911 grant that we've always gotten in the, in the past, which is about $150,000, but there's also a piece now that we budgeted that was above and beyond that due to a July 1 start date. So I believe um, the chief and uh, the deputy chief have a little bit more detail on the timing and when Westport's coming over. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And welcome to whoever's going to explain. I guess, I guess what confuses me about this and maybe we can guide the conversation this way is normally we, you know, with, we've seen with the ECC a variance in both revenue and expense, right? So if something gets delayed, we have less revenue and we have less expense. So I'm, I'm still yeah. not clear on what this net savings is, but maybe we can, maybe somebody can explain that. Sure. I'll I'll, so, I'll just start just, off with. All right, go ahead, Chief. You can go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> well, so basically, we budgeted to um, fund two thirds of the budget. So if the budget's going to be smaller, right? Because the actuals are not going to be what the budget are. Our our piece to have to fund is going to be less. So hence, we're we're kind of trying to estimate what that savings is going to be because that will come back to the general fund. So that'll be less of an expense that we've transferred out to this new regional ECC fund that we've created. Thanks, Caitlin. Understood. So I'll just give a status of uh, the current ECC uh, where we are. Um, the the go live for Westport Police, Westport Fire, and New Canaan Fire is March 1st, 2023. Uh, we have been operating for the last year uh, with a full contingency of dispatchers just for Fairfield Police and Fire Department. Um, there were some technology challenges, some vendor challenges, and um, they are set to go live on March 1st. Um, everything looks in line. Uh, we've onboarded all the employees that are coming that uh, accepted the job offers from Westport, and as of March 1st, they become uh, Fairfield employees. Um, we will have, at that time, 19 employees from the 22 vacancies that are allotted for the Emergency Communication Center. And uh, we're hoping that, you know, we're, we're I'm sure we're going to face some challenges on March 1st and probably within the next two weeks after. Uh, the transition was pretty smooth from the Fairfield side, um, so I'm not expecting anything major. Can I speak on the money? One? Sure. Keith will speak I, on the money. I can speak on the money end quickly. Um, I came up with uh, anticipated savings of about 609000 overall, so about six hundred grand, which we would realize two-thirds of that, so probably about four. Um, salary three hundred thousand. That's because they're they weren't there for um, two thirds of the year. Overtime savings about fifty thousand. Social security savings thirty, and expense ex expense savings uh, two hundred twenty nine thousand six hundred one. So it's roughly six hundred. I think four hundred will be savings on our end. I put twenty percent um, contingency on expenses for unforeseen costs when they come over, but I'm pretty confident with that number. Um, I had a lot of conversations with Caitlin about it. Did a lot of diving into Munis and what we spent and how we spend it and the vacancy reports. And I think that's a pretty solid number. Okay. Do you have any questions on that, how we came to those numbers? And I mean, those are the major ones. There's still little, little outliers, but that's for the most part, um, the meat and potatoes of the budget. Okay, I'll go to the board, but can you just clarify? So a go live date of March 1st, what was the budgeted go live date for Westport and did you say New Canaan? Yeah, Westport Police, Westport Fire, and New Canaan Fire, uh, they're all part of the interlocal agreement. Um, the go live date for Westport was anticipated to be July 1st of last year, which actually lined up nice for our new fiscal year. Um, and that didn't that didn't pan out as we expected. Okay. So, and and I'm all right. I, I do have another question, but I saw Mr. Testani had his hand up, so I'll I'll let him go first. Thanks, Madam Chair. Hey, Chiefs, how are you? Sonny, um, how are you? Good, good. Just a question, Keith, on the um, expense. Help me to understand the when you say expense, what is yep. what do you classify? What what? So what I took your definition. What's your definition of expense? Non-payroll non related. So everything from printing and binding off supplies, 
Um, anything not related to salaries. And what was that number again? So overall expenses, I, I did 229. That's uh, 200, so how many under $230,000 in office supplies? Am I? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's more than that. IT, communication, special department supplies, educational memberships, training, travel and meetings. So it's all the anything I took out, anything related to salaries, I kept in the salary, uh, let's say, bucket and anything not related to salaries because salaries were so, you know, they weren't here. So I had to, I had right. to break out yeah. salaries. They are sharing in the expenses. We've had conversations with Westport. We, we had to send them, um, finance going to be invoiced, and we had to send them a bill for a third of the of the expenses, even though they weren't here. Because we outfitted the building as if they were coming July 1st, and they didn't come. But when they get here, everything's in place for them. All the office supplies, chairs, whatever was you know, budgeted for the center was bought for the center as if 22 employees were going to be there. Right, I got you. Okay. So, so we're going to for, um, for the first half, it's 25,000 um, because our actuals, um, let's see, I, I spelt it out. So for expenses not related to employee compensation, we budgeted, budgeted 416,000. So we're way under budget. We've only used 74,000 so far, 74, um, with another 40,000 encumbered. So I safe to say we doubled the 74,000. That makes us 140, added 25%, which is another 37,000. That's how I came up with my my one, uh, 187 for expenses, which is saving us 229,000 on the expense line. Okay, and let, let me ask you this, in terms of what you're, look, you're looking at, obviously it sounds like you've got some kind of financial reporting documentation or whatever it is that you're looking at. Is that gonna be part of the overall police department budget presentation? Is that something that we could get separately. I'm just trying to, you know, I think it's, the more information we have about the ECC to get to Ms. Charlton's um, sort of question slash concern, I think the better we're going to be as far as understanding how, especially from a financial perspective, it operates. Certainly the community needs it. The ECC, the, and I think it's a, it's a great, opportunity slash investment for the police department. I just think it the more information we have, the better off we are. I'll speak for myself anyway in understanding how the how it's the funds are allocated. Jack, just if I could jump in there and if you remember last year the ECC was put into a self sustaining fund. So right. it's sort of got its own P and L. Yes, um, I understand. Right. Okay. So I think all that detail and I think maybe what was throwing me is so because it's a self-sustaining fund only the net expense if i've got that right caitlin shows up in the town budget so when we talked about expense savings here you were really referring to a net number right i'm saying there's one line item yes budget the general fund yeah. okay I got which it. is one right two-thirds cost of the anticipated expenses Correct. of this new self-sustaining fund but yeah. if these expenses lower then our contribution is lower correct I, I understand yeah and if i could just follow up with a question for the chief and and i apologize if i'm being dense here but um westport coming in i would assume would would have been expected to have a positive financial impact right on us because they're picking up some of the general overhead i guess i was surprised i'm surprised if we budgeted for them to come july 1 and they don't come until March one, that that ends up having a positive impact. And I I must am I thinking about this incorrectly? Um, I'm not personnel. Yeah, I, I think the biggest driver is the personnel because their employees were still employed in Westport and not fair for the employees. So of the million dollars, million plus that's budgeted for employees, um, we can't charge them for their employees that weren't here, but we could charge them for everything else. I would think. The, the philosophy that we kind of shared with Westport is like, if you went and leased an apartment and everything was there waiting for you and you just couldn't move in for whatever reason, uh, that was kind of the philosophy we took. So um, most of the uh, operating expenses were there and ready for those uh, employees to come over, but they just weren't ready to move in. 
Uh, and that, that was kind of the philosophy we took. So as far as the personnel, they were still paying their personnel as Westport employees. Uh, and that's that's the major driver of the the expenses. So are you saying so we I'm sorry, so we didn't get we didn't get as much revenue, we didn't have as much expense. But on a net basis, it's positive because we still got to bill them for some of the expense due to the delay in the start date. Is that a fair way to say it? I think that yeah, think that's fair. fair. Sure. Okay. And just Ms. Trona, if you don't mind, just to kind of dovetail off that, and Chief, you may have told us this in the past, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, so. The rationale behind Westport not coming on board earlier, was it, you know, concerns from the personnel? I'm just trying to, was it something they shared with you? Were they just delayed? I, I won, just wondering why they didn't come on board sooner. Sure. So um, it was, it's, it was mostly due to uh, vendor delays, um, uh, technical issues with IT development and engineering their uh, CAD and RMS system on on their side. So it was it was it was basically just the vendor who is uh, next gen um, engineering their records management system and then coordinating it also with the regional records management and CAD right. system. Yes, okay. I'm familiar with next gen. And Chief, and again, forgive me, you may have uh, talked about this at other meetings, but New Canaan, we're, the ECC is just handling the fire piece. Is that right? That's correct for the New Canaan Fire Department. And is it the same contributions or whatever, and whatever the right verbiage is you've assigned to it that Westport would have? I, I understand in Westport it's more. Than just fire, but how is New Canaan? How are those charges being assessed? Sure. So uh, previous to the uh, regional dispatch center, uh, West. I'm um, sorry, New Canaan Fire Department had a joiner agreement with the Westport Fire Department okay. dispatch center, and uh, we assumed that uh, joiner agreement. I got it. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chief. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Well, All right, thank you. Other questions on this item or anything else on expenses from the board? Okay, um, I don't see anything. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, Caitlin, um, we appreciate it. Um, Caitlin, did you have, I know you gave us this, uh, you gave us a lot more backup, including the, the, um, the grant summary, which I think is self-explanatory, and the MUNIS reports. Is there anything else on any of that backup that you want to point out to the board? You're muted. You're still muted, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, no, all the backup is the backup you guys normally get, which is the thicker MUNIS report and the line-by-line -line analysis for the, um, a lot of it is the other, it, it kind of subtotals up to the other, but no, there's nothing else in there. All right, great. All right, well, if there are no other questions um, on this, I guess we can move on to um, item seven, which is to hear a status update on active capital projects, including ARPA uh, funded projects. Um, Caitlin, are you going to take us through this or, or uh, is Jared? Uh, this is Jared. I'm on. All right, okay. Jared, welcome up to, I'll leave it, turn it over to you. Um, oh, actually, can I just uh, mention before, before we do that, I just wanted to, uh, if I can find my notes here, just wanted to point to the page number in the backup for the public. So, um, this, uh, the materials begin on page 108 of the posted backup and, and 108 starts with the ARPA project. So I guess we'll do those first. Okay, can you hear me? 
Yes, thank you. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna first talk about some changes just in the um, uh, kind of the format and some additions, um, and then there you know I might might hit on a couple of the uh, of the projects. There um, there's a request, and you know we've obviously been tracking this too because there uh, you know there were some reports early on about some of these projects that are. Um, coming in and being completed at a cost that's less than what was allocated to them. And so as of right now, we hit, there are three such projects. Uh, they all happen to be playgrounds. And uh, the way I reflected it in this report was, uh, you'll see uh, in bold print um, what the original cost was, um, what the original allocation was, and what the, the uh, final cost ended up being uh, when the project project was closed out, um, you know the dollar amount difference is not uh, not terribly significant, um, and the the sum total of those would be captured in the in the bottom line balance. Um, so if you go to the bottom of that sheet on ARPA, you'll see the the total amount that was allocated um, and so that's been that has now been updated if the amount changed for a certain project so the the total amount allocated was uh, twenty two million five hundred eighty four thousand eight hundred fifty nine dollars um, and so that again that does reflect the lower amount that was needed for those projects those three projects um, the total amount that we of ARPA funding that we got was uh, 24,800,000. So the unallocated amount is about 2.2 million. Um, we've proposed and it was actually uh, spoken about or, or uh, being considered tonight by the uh, RTM committees, uh, a few projects that we, we talked about during the uh, capital working group, uh, totaling 760,000. Which would bring the total unallocated amount to uh, one one million four hundred fifty five thousand one hundred forty four dollars. Um, so those are the uh, you know kind of high level of where the where the ARPA money stands right now, and uh, how it reflects some of the uh, some of these projects that actually came in lower than uh, than what was estimated. Um, I, I actually, I don't have a, a whole lot to report of significance on individual projects. Um, so I don't know if anybody sees anything, uh, of note in there that you have questions about. There are comments in there about what, um, you know, what the next steps are, where they're at. So, um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Um, and thank you for updating the format. I think it's helpful to see the uh, to see the balance and and just for clarity for the public, the proposed new projects that are with the RTM right now, uh, this board actually did vote to um, approve those at our last meeting. Um, Ms. Marmion, you had a question. Yeah, thank you. And I apologize, I missed the capital projects workshop meeting, but um, just. Just to understand who's, and I know I, you don't have to go through everything, but who who man who's managing these projects? Is it? I mean, some of them might be somewhat obvious, um, but some of them are not as obvious. Like the 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 playgrounds, that's Parks and Rec. I'm assuming. Um, the I'm assuming, right? Yeah, but you're right. I'm right. So just, um, I don't know. Are we concerned at all? Is there any question at all where ownership lies for seeing these projects through or are all of, all of them have an identified home and a, a department head who's, who's kind of champion, 
championing these. Is that right or or not? Yeah, yeah cool. I mean, de depending on the uh, on the project, it's going to be a, a department head who's um, who's who's champion and and um, shepherding these projects through. Okay. Any concern because this is this is obviously it's work that wasn't expected. I mean, it's it's a windfall. It's wonderful, but do we have the the staff the capability to kind of make sure these um, go through and get done? Are there any concerns, or will any of that be reflected in in the budget in terms of um, additional staffing we need to make sure these projects happen? Yes, I mean, if we had any concerns, we would definitely uh, bring that to your attention. If there were anything in here that we thought um, couldn't be accomplished, or um, you know, for whatever reason, that we would we would definitely let you know. And I think that's part of why we're doing these updates is to you know let you know the progress on these. And if as of right now, um, you know, we're we're moving forward with all these. And if at some point we can't um we think that one of them is not going to happen then we'll um you know we would come to you with a request to um deallocate that money and um if we have an alternative for it to suggest a or propose an alternative use for it um you know like we did with the although these these were not necessarily related to projects that couldn't be done but the uh these five projects that you see on there. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farman. Uh, other questions on this schedule, Mr. Matola? <clears throat> thank you. Hi, Jared, how are you? Um, I'm good, thank you. That's good. You may not know the answer to this question, but on the fill pile, it just says update forthcoming to town bodies. Do you have any idea when we're going to be getting an update on the fill pile issues. And if you don't know, you don't know. I just I'm curious about that. Um, there is a, uh, uh, to, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that when the okay. next update will, will happen, but I know that there is a, uh, you know, a hearing that is going to be coming up and, um, and so once we get, you know, when we have feedback from the hearing, um, that we will, uh, you know, we'll we'll pursue that at the time at that time once we have the once we have more information. And are, are you talking specifically? Let me just clarify. Are you talking specifically about the fill pile itself? Or are you talking about uh, remediation in general? I guess everything. <laughs> so yeah. I'm looking at the I mean, line. The, 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 help, yeah. the fill pile itself is, um, you know, that's still kind of, there's still a question mark about um, how that's going to be handled and what the, you know, what the exact cost is. The intention of this money was to go to uh, remediation generally, uh, although it may be labeled fill pilots, you know, kind of using the generic term fill pile to use it for remediation. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Uh, are there other questions from board members? Uh, Mr. Walsh. Good evening, Jared. How are you? I'm good, Jim. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for the new format. I, I think it's great. Um, very easy to follow, figure out. Um, so I appreciate all the work that you did on that. Sure. Uh, Based on the calculation of what we're supposed to, what we've gotten in versus what we still need to spend, um, there should be like $19 million approximately still in our bank account someplace of this money. Um, when we look at the spending for ARPA accounts, ARPA money, is it done on a calendar year basis? You know, when we first, um, when we first, because the, the the money was coming in on uh, uh, over a two year period, and so we sort of light I would say lightly earmarked certain projects to be done, 
uh, in the first year and certain to be done in the second year. Um, but it's it doesn't have to be that way when we when we report on this, the, you know, they're just looking to know how much we've spent um, and, and to be sure that all the spending is in compliance. So it's not not really done on a on a calendar basis. Fiscal year basis. I mean, when do we have to have the projects, all the stuff submitted? Not, I guess, fully spent, but is there, is there a two year window or three year window? End of 24, it's, I think. Yeah. It's December 2024 when everything has to be fully committed. Okay. So right. uh, either so by contract or some agreement or whatever, and then fully, it has to be spent by 2026. Okay. Caitlin was good enough to review the the amount of interest that we're making the two million dollars on. Is some of that interest coming from this nineteen million dollars we're about to have invested with this advisor. So some of it would this this would be some of that. Yes. Okay. This this will reflect some of that. Would have like an estimation, or you keep you know records of this, or or any type of spreadsheet like. How much do you see being spent of the nineteen million dollars by June thirty first, and then how much do you see having been spent by December thirty first? You keep things like that. You know, obviously well, that to, I, I, down, right. I'd have I'd have to go through the notes and probably get more thorough uh, information from the department heads on here. Um, I, you know, we haven't. Uh, looked at it in that level of, to that level of detail. Um, I will say that, um, you know, recognizing that there, this money will eventually go away and will not be there for us to, um, to be invested. Um, and so that, you know, that that's something that we're keenly aware of. Okay. Um, and, and the, uh, it, the, the funny thing because of the, inverted yield curve is that we can just, you know, we, we could hold this money in cash uh, and, and not actively put it into, uh, you know, uh, maybe not even place it with our, um, with our investment advisor and still going to make a, a, a healthy, still going to have a healthy yield on it. All right. Because what, like Caitlin was saying, the, um, the stiff even, which is, um, typically, a, a low yield um, is is getting us four and a half percent right now. Um, and uh, on the listed projects that you have there, uh, have you seen any of the projects increase in financial costs for inflationary reasons, or is that is everything really up to date on that as you see it listed? As I as we see it now, there was the the one for um, Stratfield um, that we you know we has already been approved for additional funding by all the boards. Um, yes. But other than that, um, no. And and part of that is by design that the amounts that that is being uh, set aside was a certain dollar amount, sure. not not necessarily set to a, a scope of work. Okay, and basically we have unallocated of one point four five five million for cost right. overruns on the projects that are currently listed on the sheet. Yeah, so the the cost overruns only amount amount to a small amount of money. Um, the uh, that dollar amount was related to um, initially that we. Uh, in the in the when this was originally authorized and the projects were originally authorized, there was the uh, the the, the um, theater, uh, the history museum theater that had been proposed that was eliminated, and so that left a balance there. Um, there was the uh, fiber optic, which was uh, deauthorized. Um, and so it's not necessarily because of the uh, because of the costs are are less. All right. But for example, say the the cars, the hybrid cars. We haven't purchased those yet, right? No. So if we went over on that, we would have funds still available with the one point four five five million of 
unallocated um, new projects, correct? Could you say that you cut out for a second there? What, sure. what was the question? Sure. So if, for example, I'm just going to pick one project. Let's sure. talk about the electric hybrid vehicles. Mm -hmm. Where we have currently $740,000 to buy hybrid vehicles. Are you just going to buy the vehicles up to $740,000? Or are you going to say you want a certain number of vehicles and if it comes in higher than we had anticipated the cost per vehicle, you're going to come back and try to seek some of the unallocated amount of money of 1.455 million. We had, it's, when we originally proposed this, there was, uh, I, I don't recall the number, but um, that we would buy a certain number of vehicles with this money. And so I think to, you know, we, we would evaluate it and see, we, I think we'd have to see what the, uh, what the cost per vehicle is and what the total amount would be and, and evaluate it at that time. And if we wanted to uh, do something different with it, with any excess funding that might be there, uh, you know, we'd have to go back through the boards for approval. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, other questions? Mr. Curley. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a nit for me, Jared. Just um, uh, I noticed on the bottom of page, near the bottom of page uh, one of the ARPA list, um, I understand and, and agree, uh, love the new format, uh, appreciate the effort to pull this together, uh, makes makes it a lot easier to follow. So thank you for that. I, I follow the adjustments that you made for the three per, uh, uh, playgrounds, the projects that you had talked about coming in under bud under budget, but I note that the adjustment that you noted for Dover Park, which is the fourth line from the bottom, the $150,000 of budgeted cost was not reduced in that cell of your spreadsheet so that it's not, it, it should reflect the 138.47. Um, and I did take a moment to just check and that actually does foot does not foot through so therefore your unallocated uh um value or funds uh should go from 1455 to 1474 so just want to make sure that $19,000 doesn't get lost i will i'll make that change in the next go around yeah, thank you no worries. thank you though it, it overall appreciate the uh change to the format uh, the report's great thank you Thank you, Mr. Curley. Other questions on this? Um, Jared, can I ask a question on how we are uh, accounting for these projects in the MUNA system? So um, when we normally, when we have a, a capital project, I think we have sort of a sub fund in MUNIS for, for each capital project. Is that right? Yes. So, so this, so how how are these projects being tracked through our, our system and our kind of official books and records? Is this all lumped into one capital projects fund or do we have separate accounting for each of these projects in the uh, MUNA system? Separate. We have a we have a fund, we have an ARPA fund and then there's there's separate accounts. Each one of the projects is a separate account. Got it. So each so within our system we're tracking um, you know, all the invoices and expenditures associated with each, we have separate account in our system. So we're not just reliant on this spreadsheet, in other words, but we could spit out from the system. And maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't look pretty, but it would be a similar summary and we're tracking all of this information in the event we ever, um, you know, got audited or, or got questioned about it or had money left over or whatever. Yeah, I either I go or the department heads actually go to Munis, and that's what that's what feeds us. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions on ARPA before we move on to uh, other bonded capital projects? Okay. Looks like we're set on ARPA. Um, all right, Jared. Do you want to? 
take us through the uh, other capital projects? Uh, sure. Uh, um, uh, again, not a uh, not a whole lot of highlights to report on individual projects. If um, if anybody has uh, any any questions about this, I know there's been some uh, some talk about what's included, what's not in here. Um, you know, this goes back to uh, 21 um, things that were may have been authorized in 21 um, in calendar year 21, and so that's that's what's included in here going back that. Uh, that amount of time. Um, can I just ask one question here? So, and this is part of why I think we wanted to start, you know, having these updates on a quarterly basis. So the cost that we have in the first column here, what is that number? That, I don't think, it doesn't look like those are the amounts that we authorized. Were those the, the amounts that were kind of in the bond, um, you know, sort of the use of proceeds in the, in the bond uh, documents or, or what, uh, what are those numbers? So that would be the, um, you know, I, I would look at um, the, at the one on page 113 um, for, as a good example. Um, the the HVAC for the schools is probably the most obvious one, um, and that what that shows is the amount the cost is the amount that was authorized, um, the overall amount. And then yeah, the I next, see I see some one. of the ones, in the, and I guess the reason why I'm asking is, um, you know, we the the way our process works is we authorize numbers when they're at at an estimated stage right so best best efforts are put forth to give an estimate we authorize a number but all of that happens before any bids go out the door so there's always differences between uh what we authorize and you know what the bids come in at some might be over some might be under i know in some cases in the past those differences have been you know material and so does I mean, maybe some of it ends up in the notes here, but how does that, um, does that get tracked along the way? I mean, how, how are the projects managed in terms of uh, oversight to understand, you know, how they're doing along the way? You know, so if we, if, if we, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume that if we went out to bid and a project, a bid came in, all the bids came in materially higher than what was authorized, you guys would probably come back to the boards um, and ask for an additional offer authorization. But there, there are some level of differences on all of these projects. So how is all that managed? You know, I, I know we end up doing a cleanup process years later, but you know, it just, can you tell us a little bit about how that works and how it's tracked? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've we've talked about this before, but if um, you know, if it's a significant difference, um, a significant a significant additional amount that's needed, then we would go back to the boards and ask for approval. If it's a small amount, uh, you know, for off by a thousand dollars, you know, five thousand dollars or something like that, and there's, um, uh, you know, because a lot of these these projects um, fall within the realm of or under the umbrella of DPW, if there's uh, you know, if there if there's money in their operating budget that could be used to um, to fund that, then then we would do that to round it off. Um, with these, there aren't many that have been completed yet, so um, so we you know we don't really have a lot of these that will that we know at this point what where they're going to land. Yeah, I'm not, I, and I realize a lot of these aren't completed, but I guess what I'm I'm trying to get to is, you know, they we do get bids, so we authorize, you know, let's say we approve a project in April for half a million dollars or a million dollars, let's say, and, um, you know, that project is going to start. We think it's going to start up in August, and so we go out, we issue a bond, we get a million dollars of revenue for the bond, and we go out to bid, and that. 
that those bids, the lowest one comes in at seven hundred thousand dollars. I mean, that's that's what I'm you know, and and those differences exist literally on every project, right? Because it's unusual. I mean, we never we never know what they are until we go out and bid them. So it just it seems like there's a lot of pieces in there. Where does all that money sit? And you know, does that just does that just sit in the fund? Is it tracked by project? Or how how does that work? So I don't know if this answers your question, but it, you know, in a case like that where the bid comes in less, um, I think was the uh, the hypothetical that you gave. Yeah. So, you know, I, to me, uh, you know, and we and we could think about this, but um, I don't know that I would change the amounts in here until, uh, you know, until we know that that project is completed, because you know there could be change orders or. Um, you know, whatever the case may be that that may prop up later on. Okay, I mean, does Munis have any. Um, it, it, we don't have to get into it now. I it just it's it's something I just like to understand a little bit more. I know that we have had challenges in closing out projects and we end up with a big mess and it takes. You know, an inordinate amount of time to kind of figure these things out and deauthorize whatever's left over. So. I guess I was curious what functionality there is in Munis and, and how we're really accounting for all this stuff, you know, knowing that obviously there's going to be differences on every single one of them because we're we're always, you know, authorizing them based on preliminary estimates. So, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe we could get back to that, but it would be helpful to get some background on that, I think, um, you know, and I understand, mean, I yeah, how, how we're sort of controlling that. No, knowing the, um, the just how arduous it was going through that process of having to go back so many years on some of those projects, we are we are tracking it, and and you know this is this is one way of doing it, and so we will, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're going to make more effort to uh, make whatever adjustments need to be made on the fly as these things are done, rather than. Uh, rather than years going by on these. So again, that's going to depend on each of the projects. Is it, uh, is it a large amount um, or is it some, or is it something that's, that's smaller that needs to be deauthorized um, or more ne or more needs to be authorized if it's a, a larger amount that's needed. Um, but it's, it's going to depend on each, each project individually. Um, so I can't, I can't really give you a blanket statement. It's just, but we are, we are tracking that and I don't want, uh, I don't want to have to go through it. I know Caitlin wouldn't want to have to go through it again with our bond council to go back and try to track these things down going back, you know, many, many, many years. And so, you know, we're, we, we are uh, paying attention to that. Yeah, no, I, and I know we're trying to make efforts to do that because it's hard to go back. I guess the the other thing that would be helpful to understand, and again, we don't have to get into it now, but from a process perspective, you know, if we have, um, you know, let's just say there's two projects from two different departments, DPW engineering, let's just say one of them's $100,000 over, one of them's $100,000 under. I mean, if that, you know, do you guys offset those funds? What's the process to do? Yeah, that's the part that gets fuzzy to me because I know that we have all of these differences and knowing how preliminary these numbers are, it's very rare that you guys come back to us for um, additional funds on projects. So, yeah. you know, I'm guessing that either they're all conservative estimates or some overs and unders are getting uh, you know, kind of managed within the capital projects fund. So, you know, I, I think that it would be helpful to understand that process going forward. I don't want to so, take up too so much time and, with it now. And so I, you know, to, to give you kind of a, a broad answer would be that we, again, we'd go case by case and we talked to bond council about it, just like we did with the, these ones that have been hanging out there for years. Uh, the difference would be, you know, we'd be addressing them as they come up and not, not waiting a long time to address them. So, it, it, you know, and you can give the hypothetical of one going up, one going down. I think our bond council would have to look at that and look at the nature of each project and make a determination about how, you know, whether or not they could offset each other or if there would have, or, you know, we'd have to address them individually. 
and you'll see some of that at work when we come to you, um, you know, hopefully the next meeting on the second to um, make those deauthorizations, reallocations and and the like, you'll see some of that happening. And that's, you know, that's why it's, it'll be important for bond council to be at that meeting as well. Okay. Um, other questions. All right, from board, any, anybody have any questions on any specific projects in here? Um, so, Jared, just one, just in general, are there any any of these that you know uh, that are delayed for any reason or? Um, uh, other than the notes, you know, you, you have uh, pretty much what I have at this point. Um, okay. You know, these are these notes are maybe a couple weeks old, but um, so unless there's something different um that's happened over the last couple of weeks then um you know you're you're seeing it all right thank you all right if there are no other questions from the board um we can move on is everybody okay all right all right so thank you for that jared all right so with that um we'll move on to item eight uh, to hear, consider, and act upon the draft minutes of January 31, 2023. Um, can I have a motion to hear this item? I'll make a motion. Somebody want a second? <laughs> All right, Mr. Uh, Testani. Um, okay, the draft minutes um, begin on page 108 of the posted backup. Uh, any comments from the board on these minutes? Mr. Matola. No, I was just saying I see Mr. DeWitt's hand up. Oh, oh, sorry, Chris. I don't see you down there. Mr. DeWitt, go ahead. No, it's okay. Thank you. Um, in re in regards to number six, which is on the last page 116, um, it says that I made a motion, Mr. Matola seconded. And that the vote was four zero three. I, I think that's inaccurate. I the way I don't recall, and, and please correct me. I remember Mr. Testani abstaining. I do not remember Mr. Walsh or Mr. Stark um, voting against. So just want to clarify. I had the same question. I think those were three abstentions. I think Mr. Stark and Mr. Walsh may not have been at at that meeting. That's that right. was my. Okay, I, I agree that they're supposed to be abstentions. Okay, so can I may I make a motion and, and the vote shows it because it shows the 3 of us. It's just the wording doesn't yeah, right. yeah it's just the word. So I guess I make a, a motion to just change the word. And number 6 from a, to um, Stark test on Walsh instead of against change that to abstain. Please okay, I'll 2nd that. Um, comments on that. Amendment and that's actually in 2 places. Sorry. Right. Um, it's it's in the, the very last sentence of number 6 and then in the paragraph above. Okay, any questions or comments on that amendment? Okay, all in favor of the amendment uh, that Mr. DeWitt stated. Please raise your hand. Um, looks like we are unanimous 9 0. Thank you. Um, if nobody else, I just have 1 little nit here um, on page two, the last paragraph of item four, in the middle of the paragraph, it says, Ms. Charlton um, suggested developing a fund policy for the WPCA, that, that should state fund balance policy. So if we could just, um, so just wanna insert the word balance um, in there so everyone knows what that means. Uh, so I would make that, um, so I'll propose that amendment or make a motion to propose inserting the word balance so that that says fund balance policy. Um, I'll second Mr. That. Walsh, is that a second? Second, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, any, other, any questions? Okay. All in favor of that amendment? Please say aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That looks unanimous, 9-0. 
All right, any other comments on these minutes? Okay, all right, with that, then we'll move to a vote. Uh, all in favor of approving the, minute, the minutes as amended, please say aye. Okay, Mr. Matola, I don't, can I, is your hand up? Okay, great. And Ms. Marmion, is your hand up? Okay. I'm going to uh, abstain. Okay, gotcha. All right. So the uh, the motion passes eight. Oh, so wait. So Ms. Marmion, you're abstaining. You weren't at the meeting. I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. So did did you vote for the amendments then, or did you mean to abstain? I voted the for the amendments, but I'm voting to abstain from approving the minutes overall. Maybe I should have abstained from the amendments, but they seemed reasonable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. All right. So it uh, looks like the vote is um, 801 uh, in favor. Um, all right. We are done with the minutes. So I will move to item nine to hear, consider, and act on any communications. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, do you have anything for us? No, nothing further. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything. Any other board members? Madam Chair. Yes, we're, we have to go into executive session. Yeah, we will, um, to, as soon as, if there are no other communications, we can uh, take a motion to move into executive session. I, I just, Madam Chair. Yep. I just want to bring up one uh, piece of communication, and that is the moving of our March meeting, which, yes. you know, I know we all received uh, uh, an email at, at su suggesting that we move our March 1st meeting to March 2nd. Is that right? Yes, right. Is, was there, and I know from a Robert's Rules perspective, you're allowed to do that as the chair. I'm not questioning that piece of it. I just, it, was there a particular reason why we're moving? Because it then becomes a special meeting. So Correct. I'm just curious. Yeah, it does become a special meeting. And my apologies, that was, uh, you know, candidly, my mistake did not have the meeting on my calendar. I have a conflicting, uh, you know, I have a conflict. And so if it was okay with everybody else and everyone else could make the second, uh, I wanted to see if we could do it on the second and it looks like everybody could make it. So I appreciate that. So we, so what will happen is we'll send out a, you know, cancellation for the first and uh, we'll be rescheduled up to the second as a special meeting. All right, and you know, thank you everybody for your um, flexibility, Mr. Walsh. Um, I just want to ask, um, Madam Chairwoman, were you seeking us to tell you whether we could make it on the second? I was a little confused. I thought you just unilaterally had just decided it was going to be on the second. So you know, I agree, Jim. I, I just oh, would okay. like, I, in the future, I would prefer because this time I could do it, but other times I might not. Mm -hmm. and, so it just seemed different than the way you had done this before when like the January meeting, you asked whether we could move it on a specific right. day. So I'm just trying to figure out what. No, I would always, yeah, no, thank you. I would always want to uh, ask for the, ask for the courtesy of making sure a meeting could be moved. And, you know, I think in the past we've done it sometimes, you know, there's been a couple of people that couldn't make it to a meeting. So we tried to get another date where more people could make it or we could have a quorum, et cetera. So if I didn't um, sort of pull the group versus, you know, I didn't intend to state it unilaterally. So my apologies if I did that. But again, okay. I want to thank everyone for their flexibility. I think and I appreciate you being willing to do this. Uh, pull the group. I appreciate that. Thank yes, you that. absolutely. That's that's that was my intent. So sorry if that didn't come across. All right. Um, so. I'm going to Prue um, or yes. Fair TV or whoever. Do we know how to? Um, I think what we need to do is move all of the yes. um, other participants into the lobby um, so yes. that we can. Well, why don't we take a motion first to go into executive session? Um, Mr. Walsh, seconded by Mr. Testani. Um, do we have to vote on this, I guess? Yes, all in favor? All right, I think we voted before, but it's now official. All right, so I will wait for, um, and bear with me, I think I have a note in the room here. Okay, so um, the participants are, the other participants are gonna be moved into the lobby and we are going to uh, pause recording on WebEx and then we'll start the executive session.
Yeah, so I just need uh, just a few minutes while I, I do this, and I will let you know as soon as everything is done. Okay, and I just do want to note for, um, you know, in case anyone's not following the agenda for members of the public, that there is nothing um, after this item other than to adjourn. Okay, let's see. All right, Fair TV is all set, so we're we're back. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, we um, uh, we're coming out of executive session. No votes were taken. Um, can I have a motion to come out of executive session? Mr. DeWitt, seconded by Mr. Walsh. All in favor? I think Aye. we have to vote. Okay, unanimous. All right, that is it. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Um, Mr. Walsh, seconded by Mr. Curley. All in favor? Aye, it is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.